Hi and welcome to part two of our course. Part two is all about long-term investing and long-term wealth accumulation. And uh, we will cover a few different strategies and ways to reach uh, that goal. And uh, we will start uh, with uh, some important definitions. So indexes, uh, portfolios, ETFs and benchmarks are somehow related, but not the same. And then we will compare major investment approaches. So from uh, pure passive investing over semi-active investing to active investing. And then we will start with ETF investing and index uh, tracking or replication. Followed by ETF trading with interactive brokers and the API, which works pretty much in the very same way as ordinary stock trading. And then we will define a customized investment strategy and uh, create a customized index for the strategy. And then we try to track that index. And finally, we invest uh, with interactive brokers. And then uh, we have a more theoretical part that will help us to understand uh, the general mechanics and ideas behind portfolio investing and uh, portfolio diversification. And finally, I will introduce a theoretically well-founded and data-driven approach to active investing with uh, the Black Litterman model. So stock picking in the worst case is just uh, picking few stocks that you actually like, or you can go the more systematic way and uh, one helpful tool is uh, the Black Litterman model. So this is part two of our course. Enjoy it and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next sections and lectures. Bye. Welcome to the section on financial indexes. In this and the next videos, you will learn the fundamentals of financial indexes and in particular stock indexes. And you will understand not only the importance of indexes and why indexes are heavily used in the investment industry, but, and as uh, this is still a Python coding course, you will have uh, the opportunity to create your own customized uh, stock index. And finally, we will also elaborate on the choices and issues in index construction and uh, learn the pros and cons of uh, different index types. All right, and even if you have no detailed knowledge on financial indexes, I'm pretty sure that you get in touch with indexes almost every day when uh, you read the news. So, for example, you can see headlines like uh, US stocks mixed at close of trade, Dow Jones Industrial Average down 0.04%. So, what does uh, this headline tell us? And instead of listing all US stocks here, so we have uh, a few thousand stocks actually, they simply say that the Dow Jones is uh, down 0.04%. And uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is actually an index and uh, kind of measures, aggregates, or summarizes the performance of uh, US stocks and actually one number here. And there are actually many examples of uh, financial indexes or in particular stock indexes. So we have here the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, which actually measures uh, the performance of uh, 30 large uh, US stocks. Then we have here the S&P 500, which aggregates and measures uh, 500 uh, large US stocks. Then we have here the Nasdaq Composite, which is actually heavily weighted uh, towards uh, tech stocks. Then we have here the Nikkei 225, which contains 225 large Japanese stocks. Then we have here the Eurostox uh, 50 with uh, 50 large uh, European stocks. And uh, also we have here the uh, DAX uh, 30, which includes uh, 30 large uh, German stocks. And there are actually many more indexes, not only stock indexes, but also fixed income or bond indexes and uh, commodity indexes. So there's actually no restriction on that here. So why do we use indexes and why are indexes uh, useful? And uh, we've already learned that an index uh, represents, aggregates and measures uh, the performance of an asset class. And an asset class can be actually everything. So for example, bonds or commodities. And here in our examples uh, that we have seen, an asset class can also be a stock market segment. For example, US large cap. And uh, large cap actually uh, stands for large uh, capitalization. And actually the market capitalization is uh, nothing else uh, than the equity value of a company. So the segment US uh, large cap simply includes uh, large uh, US companies in terms of uh, market value. And there's actually no limit to narrow down the segment definition. 
So we could also say US large cap in the finance industry, for example. Then as a second point, indexes are heavily used as model portfolio or benchmark. And typically small investors wish to invest in the broad market, but uh, they're actually unable to invest in 50 or 100 separate stocks. And uh, therefore we have uh, the funds industry that creates mutual funds or exchange traded funds, ETFs. And these funds actually use indexes as model portfolio or benchmark to create and uh, define their funds. And those fund managers try to match or to track uh, the performance of the index as close as possible. So typically the fund managers advertise their funds by saying that, for example, the fund is uh, closely tracking the S&P 500. And by investing only in uh, this fund, investors actually invest in 500 uh, large US stocks. And finally, indexes also serve as a performance benchmark to evaluate historical investment performance. So exposed, uh, the question is always, uh, did the fund uh, beat the benchmark or not? And uh, let's assume we have a fund that claims to track the S&P 500. And in the last year, it showed a positive return of 10%, which is actually great. But uh, this has to be compared to the performance of uh, the S&P 500 index. And if the benchmark, which is in this example, the S&P 500, returned 15% uh, in the same period, then uh, the fund manager did actually a pretty poor job. All right, these are the main use cases of financial indexes and uh, the rationale behind indexes. And the next question would be how to create an index. And there are several options or choices uh, that we have to consider. And in total, we have actually five steps. And uh, the very first step is actually to define the target market, which our index should cover or aggregate. And as I said before, there's actually no limit. So the target market can be uh, very broad. So for example, US stocks, but it can also be very narrow. So for example, the segment uh, US uh, large cap finance. And once we have defined uh, the target market or target segment, then uh, the question is uh, which uh, securities to include in our index. And first of all, we have to identify the securities in our segment. And as a second step, we have to select the securities uh, that we want to include into our index. And uh, these uh, securities are the so-called constituents of the index. And typically there are fundamental and measurable criteria to select the constituents. So for example, the market capitalization, but uh, in most cases, uh, there are also soft facts uh, that are evaluated by a committee. So let's go to the next step and let's assume that we have selected the constituents. Then the next uh, question would be how to weight uh, these uh, constituents in our index. And there are actually three major methods how to weight uh, the constituents. So we have uh, price weighted indexes, so then we have equal weighted indexes and value weighted indexes. And in the next videos, we will examine those methods in detail. But uh, then we have here the next step. It's uh, the index return. And here we have to define whether our index uh, should be a price return index or a total return or performance index. And the difference is simply that a price return index uh, does not uh, contain uh, dividends. So typically the total return of a index and also of a stock consists of uh, the price return or price increase or decrease and uh, the dividend payments. And a total return or performance index includes uh, both. And in contrast, uh, the price return index uh, excludes actually dividend payments. And actually for the large and well-known indexes, uh, both uh, variants exist. But uh, there's uh, always uh, one variant uh, that is uh, more prominent, actually. So, for example, if somebody's talking about the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average, then he typically means uh, the price return index. And finally, once we have defined and uh, created our index, there are some ongoing things to do. So, for example, we have uh, the rebalancing. And here we have to define how and when to rebalance uh, the weights that can actually drift apart from the target weights. And uh, second, we have also the reconstitution. And the question is here when and how to reconstitute uh, the index and uh, to change uh, the constituents in the index. So that's actually the five major steps of index construction. And as uh, this is here a coding course, we will focus on uh, the technical steps. 
so the weighting and uh, the return. And finally, I would show you some examples of indexes here. So we have here the Dow Jones index, which uh, covers actually 30 large US stocks. And uh, the weighting is actually price weighting. And uh, typically, when we are talking about the Dow Jones index, it's uh, the price return index, but also the total return index exists. Then we have here the Nikkei 225, which covers 225 large Japanese stocks. And uh, we have here actually a price weighting and it's actually a price return index, but also here the total return index uh, exists as well. And then we have also the Eurostox 50 index and the DAX 30 index. And uh, those two indexes are actually value weighted indexes. And if you talk about the DAX 30, then you typically mean the total return index. So these are four index examples. And uh, with this, we are finished here and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. All right, let's start coding. And first we need to load and prepare some data. So for this section, we need pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and also yfinance. And uh, then we load uh, historical price data for the 30 constituents, so the 30 Dow Jones constituents, and uh, the index itself from the CSV file Dow Jones index constituents. And uh, we save the data frame in DF. So we have here actually 31 symbols so the 30 constituents and uh, the dow jones index itself and uh, we delete here rows uh, with some miss missing values and then we separate uh, the daily close prices so here we can see on the right that uh, we have uh, the dow jones index as well so the prices so we have 31 columns and 558 uh, trading days since uh, end of August 2020. And then let's move on with uh, simple returns. So we can calculate simple returns uh, with uh, the percentage change method. And whenever we calculate portfolio returns or index returns, then uh, we should uh, work with uh, simple returns. So we have learned this before. So we have uh, the 30 constituents and the index and uh, the index here. So the symbol is Dow Jones index and uh, the constituents. So we can get a list or an index object uh, with uh, the 30 constituents here. And uh, with this, we are best prepared to create some indexes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. We have already learned that uh, there are three major weighting methods when constructing an index. And in this and the next video, we will focus on price weighting. And we will learn how to create a price weighted index with Python and Pandas, and also the pros and cons of a price weighted index. So when selecting the price weighting method, the constituents are weighted by their stock prices. And uh, let's assume we create an index uh, with only two stocks and uh, stock A has a price of uh, 2 and stock B has a price of 8, then actually the weighting of stock A in the index is uh, 20%, so 2 divided by 10, and uh, the weighting of stock B is 80%. And there's actually a pretty easy intuition behind uh, creating uh, price-weighted indexes. It's uh, like uh, purchasing an equal amount of shares of each constituent. And uh, the most uh, easy example is uh, one share. So if our index consists of uh, two constituents, then we can simply create the index by purchasing uh, one share per constituent. So that's uh, the easy intuition behind the price weighted index. And let's have a look at an easy example with uh, some numbers. So let's assume we have here stock A and stock B, and we have two timestamps. So we have timestamp uh, zero and one. This could be uh, yesterday and uh, today. And yesterday we had stock prices of uh, 5 for stock A and 10 for stock B. And today the stock prices moved uh, to 8 for both stocks. Then as uh, we learned before, to create a price weighted index, we simply have to buy one share for each stock. And uh, by doing so at timestamp 0, our index or our portfolio with uh, the two shares is worth uh, 15. 
And consequently, the value of our index uh, at timestamp one is uh, 16. So we simply summed up the stock prices of the constituents. And uh, we defined that at timestamp zero, our index should have a base value of uh, 100. And now the task would be uh, to calculate uh, the value of our index at timestamp one. And uh, we can simply do this by having here 100 times uh, 16 divided by 15. And this gives us uh, the index value at timestamp one of 106.67. So this is uh, the easy example and so to say the shortcut. And this shortcut works uh, pretty well here for the price weighted index. However, there is a more general approach which we will use uh, for the value weighted index or also for the equal weighted index. And uh, the more general approach actually always works. And in most cases, I prefer the more general approach because uh, they work in each and every case. So let's have a look here. So again, here we have our prices and having the prices here, we can also calculate uh, the weights of uh, the constituents in a price weighted index. So we have uh, one share per constituent and in total we have at timestamp zero a value of 15 and therefore the weight of stock A is uh, here 0 0.33, so 5 divided by 15 and consequently the weight of uh, stock B in our index is 0.67. And then as a next step, we calculate uh, the returns of our constituents. So this is here actually uh, the returns table. And at timestamp zero, we do not have any returns because uh, there's here no timestamp minus one. So the weighted average uh, does also not exist here. And we also define that uh, the initial index value or the base value should be 100. And now we can actually calculate simple returns for the period from timestamp zero to one. And uh, for stock A, it's uh, 60%. So this is simply eight divided by five minus one. And uh, consequently, the return for stock B is uh, eight divided uh, by 10 minus one is uh, minus 20%. And then we can calculate uh, the weighted average return. And we actually weight uh, the returns with uh, the weights at timestamp zero. So that's uh, the important part here that uh, we created the 60% return of stock A and uh, minus 20% return of stock B with uh, the weights uh, that we had at timestamp zero. So 0 0.33 and 0 0.67. And uh, therefore we can calculate uh, the weighted average return by weighting the return of stock A 0 0.6 uh, with 0 0.33 and by weighting the return of stock B minus 20% with 0 0.67. And uh, this gives us a weighted average return of 6.7%. And now finally we know that our index value at timestamp uh, zero is 100. Then we have an index return of 6.7%. And uh, therefore, we can calculate the index value at timestamp one. And uh, this is simply 100 times uh, one plus 6.7%. Uh, and also here we get the index value of 106.67. So this is uh, the more general approach, which is uh, a bit more complicated, but uh, this should work actually in each and every case. All right, so now let's go to the pros and cons of uh, the price weighted index. And uh, one advantage is, uh, we have seen that, that it's uh, quite easy to compute and we actually only need uh, very few data. So we only need the price history of our constituents. Then next, uh, the intuition behind a price weighted index is uh, pretty easy. So it's like having a portfolio where we have uh, one share or an equal amount of shares per constituent. And finally, a price weighted index is uh, self-rebalancing. So that means uh, that we do not have to rebalance uh, the weights of the constituents as uh, the time goes on. And uh, this uh, minimizes actually transaction costs and also taxes. And we will see later in the equal weighted index that an index does not automatically get uh, self rebalanced. All right, and let's go also to the disadvantages of a price weighted index. So first of all, a price weighted index might have concentrated positions in stocks with uh, the highest prices. So if we have stock A with a price of two and stock B with a price of eight, then we have a concentrated position in stock B. 
And having high prices does not necessarily mean that uh, the stock has a high value or has uh, economic importance. So the market capitalization actually better reflects a company's economic importance. And the market capitalization is actually the product of uh, price and uh, the number of shares. So let's assume we have a stock with a very high price, so for example 1000. So if there are in total only 10 stocks in the market, then the company has only a little economic importance, uh, but it has a quite high price and a high weight in a price weighted index. And moreover, a price weighted index uh, does not necessarily reflect a typical portfolio construction. So actually investors and funds uh, rarely buy an equal number of shares. And finally, stock splits uh, can complicate uh, the construction of a price weighted index. So stock splits are beyond uh, the scope of this course, but let's assume we have a stock with a price of 1000, then the company could decide to split the stock and distribute for each stock uh, two stocks and then the stock price automatically declines to 500 and this has to be considered and reflected in a price weighted index. But uh, for us uh, this is actually no problem as uh, the historical prices uh, that we get from Yahoo Finance already include uh, the impact of uh, stock splits. And uh, with uh, this we are finished here with uh, this video and I hope to see you also in the next one. Bye! Now let's move on with uh, the price weighted index uh, which can be calculated quite easily because it's simply uh, the sum of all prices and uh, to get uh, then the index we need to divide uh, the sum of all prices uh, throughout the period by the sum of prices at uh, the very first day so the starting day and let's start here with uh, the closing prices of all 30 constituents so we filter the data frame close by the constituents, so 30 in total. And then we can calculate uh, the sum of all prices on day one. So here on the 31st of October, we can simply sum them up with uh, the uh, sum method. And uh, we have to set uh, the axis parameter to one to actually sum up per row. So th to get uh, the sum per row or in a row and then we get uh, the sum of the very first row with uh, zero here. So in this case, it's 4,311. And now we can simply calculate uh, the index with a base value of 100. So 100 on the 31st of August. And for this, uh, we sum up all rows and divide this by 4,311. And then we multiply the result with a base value of 1 with 100 to get a base value of 100. And uh, this is it actually. So with uh, this code we can create uh, the price weighted index. So starting with 100 and uh, two years later we end at 118.21. So this is a panda series and uh, we can assign a name. So price weighted index. So now here we have the name of uh, the panda series or so to say the column. And actually we have already learned uh, that uh, the Dow Jones index is a price weighted index. And uh, we can now make uh, the cross check. So whether the Dow Jones uh, data is actually the very same as uh, the price weighted index uh, that we calculated here. And therefore we select here the close price of the Dow Jones index and we normalize uh, the Dow Jones index here also to a base value of 100. So the Dow Jones index normalized at a value of 100 on the 31st of August. And now we can compare the calculated price index and uh, the Dow Jones index, so the data that we retrieved from Yahoo Finance. And uh, we can see here that uh, the numbers are more or less uh, the same so there might be some rounding issues and uh, we can also visualize uh, this so we can compare our calculated index and uh, the Dow Jones index normalized. And here we have in blue the uh, calculation and in orange the data and uh, they are essentially the very same. So our calculation works here. And now one interesting question is, uh, so what are the weights of uh, the constituents over time? And uh, we can calculate uh, the weights as uh, follows. 
And uh, we simply can divide uh, the prices of uh, the single constituents by the sum per row. And uh, by doing so, we get uh, the weights over time. So for example, for Apple, we start here with uh, 3% and also we end here at uh, 3%. And it's just best uh, to visualize uh, the weights over time. So depending on whether prices increase or decrease, so then also the weights uh, should increase or decrease. And actually here we can see that uh, the stock with uh, the highest weight has around about eight to 10 or 12% weight. And uh, we could conclude here that uh, we do not uh, really have concentrated positions here in the price weighted index. So weights are between uh, zero or 1% and 8%. So that's uh, quite diversified here and not really concentrated. And now we could focus on Apple and Microsoft. So in terms of market capitalization, these uh, two stocks are by far the most important ones, but in terms of uh, the weights in the price weighted index, so we have Microsoft between five and 6% of four and 6% and Apple around uh, two and a half and uh, 3%. So we can conclude here that uh, in the price weighted index, we do not have uh, concentrated positions, for example, in the Apple stock or the Microsoft stock. And uh, we will continue with uh, the other indexes in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this and next videos, we will examine and create the equal weighted index. And the idea behind it is uh, pretty simple. So all constituents in the index are equal weighted. And that means equal weighted in monetary terms. And actually the intuition is uh, that we invest equal dollar amounts into each constituent. So the easiest example is to have only two constituents and a total investment sum of $2,000. Then we invest 50% uh, of our investment sum into stock A and 50% uh, into stock B. So let's have a look at an easy example with some numbers. And it's actually here the same example as before. So we have two timestamps and two stocks and uh, here we have the prices. And uh, then we can also create uh, the uh, simple returns. So of course we have here at timestamp zero, no returns and also no weighted average return. And the base value of our index shall be 100. And then we calculate the returns for the period from timestamp 0 to 1. And it's 60% uh, for stock A and uh, minus 20% for stock B. And then we have to calculate the weighted average return of uh, stock A and B. And as we have equal weighting and an equal weighted index, then consequently we have to weight uh, the returns of stock A and stock B with 50% uh, or 0 0.5 and we get a weighted average return for that period of uh, 20%. And uh, finally, starting with an index value of 100 and having 20% return in the first period gives us an index value at the end of the first period of uh, 120. So we simply multiply 100 by one plus uh, 20%. So that's how we calculate the index value at uh, timestamp one. And now let's go to a more general example with uh, more periods. So we have two periods. So here we have in addition uh, the timestamp two and still we have uh, the returns here. And again, our base value at the timestamp zero should be uh, 100. And now for the period from timestamp one till timestamp two, we have a return for stock A of minus 10% and a return of 30% for stock B and therefore a weighted average return for that period of 10%. And uh, as you can see here, we have an additional column cumulative investment multiple. And for the first period, the cumulative investment multiple is uh, simply the return of the very first period, 20% plus one gives uh, 1.2. And by multiplying 1.2 with uh, the initial index value 100 gives us 120. And now let's go on and calculate the cumulative investment multiple and the index value for timestamp two. And the calculation of the cumulative investment multiple is uh, pretty straightforward. So we have two periods and in one period we have 20% return average and in one period 
And the cumulative investment multiple is simply 1 plus 20% times 1 plus 10% uh, gives uh, 1.32. Uh, and by multiplying the cumulative investment multiple with uh, the initial index value 100 gives us actually uh, the index value at the uh, timestamp 2, 132. And let's also have a look at the pros and cons of uh, the equal weighted index. And uh, one main advantage of the equal weighted index is uh, that by definition uh, the equal weighted index shows uh, a maximum degree of diversification. So we have no concentrated positions as uh, all constituents have uh, the same weight. And second also the equal weighted index is uh, pretty intuitive. So you have an equal investment amount uh, invested uh, in each constituent. And now let's go also to the disadvantages. So typically the performance of the equal weighted index is biased uh, towards the smaller stocks as smaller stocks have a higher proportion or higher weight in the equal weighted index uh, than they would have in a price weighted or value weighted index. And typically smaller stocks uh, show higher risk but uh, sometimes also higher return. So typically an equal weighted index uh, is uh, riskier. And also here the market capitalization better reflects a company's economic importance. And another point is uh, that typically the equal weighted index does uh, not reflect typical portfolio construction. So investors uh, rarely invest uh, equal amounts into constituents. And finally, and this is a big point, an equal weighted index or a portfolio that follows an equal weighted index uh, requires constant rebalancing. So let's assume that uh, we invest $100 in stock A and $100 in stock B. And in the first period, the price of stock A increases and the price of stock B decreases. So in this case, uh, the weights are actually no longer 50-50 or equal. And uh, we would be required to rebalance. So we sell winners and buy losers. And uh, this means actually high transaction costs and also taxes. So from a practical point of view, the equal weighted index is actually uh, not the best choice. And uh, with this we are finished here and I hope to see you also in the next videos. Bye. Now let's move on with uh, the equal weighted index. And also here the calculation is pretty simple. So we can calculate uh, the mean return over time. So the daily mean return for each and every day. And uh, we still have saved here the uh, simple daily returns for the 30 constituents and also for the Dow Jones index itself. And then we can calculate uh, the mean return. So on each and every day for the constituents. So this is uh, the mean return. And taking the mean means uh, equally weighted. So each uh, constituent uh, with uh, its return has uh, the very same weight as all other constituents. So these are the simple returns of uh, the equal weighted index. And now we can turn the simple returns into a normalized prices uh, with a base value of 100 on the very first day. So we add one, then we can calculate uh, the cumulative product and multiply with 100. And uh, here we have now the equal weighted index. So starting with uh, the base value 100 at uh, the very first day. And therefore we have to overwrite here the missing value with 100. And finally, we can give a name to the Panda series. So equally weighted index. So starting with 100 and uh, two years later, we end at uh, 118.56. So this was uh, the equal weighted index and uh, we will continue with uh, the value weighted index. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this and the next videos, we will finally learn how to construct a value weighted or also called market cap weighted index. And from a theoretical point of view, the value weighted index is uh, the most meaningful index as it reflects how the aggregate market and the average investor is invested in the market. Because uh, the constituents are weighted in proportion to their market capitalization. So the market capitalization is uh, nothing else than the company's total equity value. And uh, we can calculate the market capitalization by multiplying the stock price uh, with uh, the shares outstanding. So let's assume we have a stock with a stock price of 100 and we have in total 10 shares for that stock. 
So the total market capitalization is uh, 100 times 10 is uh, 1000. So the total equity value of that company is uh, 1000. And uh, there's actually a difference between total shares and uh, free float. So typically some shares are privately held by founders and executives and uh, they're actually not available for the public. And a free float market capitalization weighted index only takes into account the number of uh, public available shares. But that's actually beyond the scope of this course and uh, this is all you need to know here. And let's go to an easier example with some numbers. So still we have here our prices for stock A and B and uh, we also have uh, the number of shares. So on timestamp uh, 0 and timestamp 1 we have uh, 10 shares for stock A and uh, 4 shares of stock B in the market. And having the prices and uh, the number of shares outstanding, then we can calculate for each and every timestamp the market capitalization. So the market capitalization for stock A at uh, timestamp 0 is simply 5 times 10. So 5 times 10. And the market cap for stock A in timestamp 1 is uh, consequently 80, so 8 times 10. And uh, the same we can calculate for stock B. So these are the market capitalizations for stock B. And then finally we can take the sum for stock A and stock B. So the total market cap uh, for those two stocks is uh, 90 in timestamp uh, 0 and uh, 112 at timestamp 1. And now we can create our value weighted index. So as always uh, the base value at uh, timestamp 0 is 100 and uh, the value at timestamp 1 we can simply calculate by multiplying 100 times the 112 divided by 90 gives 124.44. So that's uh, the easy way how to calculate a value weighted index, but uh, the easy way does not work if for example one company issues additional shares to the market and uh, we can have a look at an example here. So still we have here the stock prices, then we have here the amount of shares and we assume now that company A issues on the timestamp 1 additional 10 stocks. So that in total we have uh, 20 stocks at uh, timestamp 1. And we also assume that uh, the stock price does not change so it uh, remains at 8. And the new investors also pay $8 per new share. And uh, again we can have a look at the market capitalization. So we have actually an increase of total market value for stock A from 80 to 160 and this is not because of the performance of uh, company A or stock A is uh, so great. It's simply because of the new investors paid in into the company 80 for the new 10 stocks. So for the investors of the already existing 10 shares there shouldn't be any impact actually. But we can see here that the total sum of market cap increases to 192. And then if we simply calculate the evaluated index as uh, we have done before, then uh, we get uh, the result uh, that uh, the value of our index at timestamp 1 is uh, 213.33. So this seems like existing investors uh, realized a great uh, return in the period from timestamp 0 to 1, but of course uh, this is actually not the case. So this is here completely wrong what we did here. And uh, now I will show you the right way and the more general way how to do this. So we still have um, our stock prices, then we have our number of shares and uh, then we have our market capitalization. And then we calculate the weight of the constituents in proportion to the market capitalization. So the weight of stock A at the timestamp 0 is uh, 50 divided by 90 is uh, 56% and uh, consequently uh, the weight for stock B is uh, 0.44. So these are the proportional market cap weights and again here we have them and also we have the prices. And then finally we calculate uh, the returns. So this is actually nothing new here. And for stock A we have a return in the period of uh, 60% and for stock B of uh, minus uh, 20%. And then we simply have to calculate the weighted average return. And we weight the returns of stock A and stock B by the weights of their market capitalization at the beginning of the period. And this is uh, 56% and uh, 44%.
and still the initial index value is 100 and uh, we calculate the weighted average return here so 60 percent weighted with 56 uh, percent and minus 20 percent multiplied by 44 percent and this gives a weighted average return of 24.4 percent and uh, once we have uh, the weighted average return then we can also calculate uh, the index value at timestamp 1 and uh, this is again 124.44. So that's again the more general approach where we weight uh, the returns of the constituents uh, with uh, the respective weights. And in case of a value weighted index, uh, the weights are determined by the market capitalizations. All right, and let's also go here to the pros and cons. And the major advantage of uh, the evaluated index is uh, that it uh, best reflects uh, the aggregate market or the average investor portfolio. And therefore, as a second advantage, the weights of the constituents are based on economic importance. So the companies with uh, the highest values and uh, the highest uh, economic impact have uh, the highest weights in a value-weighted index. And finally, same as uh, the price weighted index, so typically a value weighted index does not require rebalancing. So the value weighted index is self rebalancing because uh, there are no fixed weights. So if stock A goes up and uh, stock B goes down, then that's uh, the new weights and uh, that's it actually. All right, and let's uh, finally have a look at uh, the disadvantages of a value weighted index. So in most cases, a valuated index shows some kind of over concentration in a few stocks with a high market capitalization. And this means that a valuated index is uh, compared, for example, to a equal weighted index, uh, poorly diversified. And some market participants argue that uh, the highest uh, valued stocks uh, may be uh, the most overvalued stocks. So the major reason why they are highly valued is uh, that uh, they are actually overvalued. And some studies show that the valuated indexes actually underperform other indexes. And this is uh, simply the case because overvalued stocks might perform poorly in the near future. And finally, for a valuated index, uh, the data needs are quite high. So we need uh, the stock prices. And in addition, we need uh, for each and every timestamp and for each and every constituent, the shares outstanding. And if we are creating a free float market cap weighted index, then in addition, we need information on the free float shares. That's it for now. And I hope to see you also in the next videos where we will create our value weighted index with Python. Bye. So far, we have seen two weighting techniques. So by historical prices and uh, equally weighted and uh, the data requirement was fairly low so we needed historical prices. But now let's continue with uh, the value weighted index or also called uh, the market cap weighted index. And as uh, the name says we need historical market caps for the weighting and historical market caps is one of uh, those rare things that are really hard to obtain from free web sources. So on Yahoo Finance you won't find historical market caps, so there's only the current market cap. But still the good news is that we can make a good approximation here. So that's the plan for this and the next lectures, as I want to demonstrate as much as possible with free data sources. However, later in the course I might cover a cheap but still paid data source that includes historical market caps. So let's continue with an approximation, a good approximation, at least for large stocks and uh, mature stocks like those uh, that we can find in the Dow Jones index. And actually we have already learned that the market cap can be calculated as uh, the outstanding shares times uh, the price. And uh, we can get uh, the current market cap and also the current outstanding shares from Yahoo Finance. So let's again import Yahoo Finance and still we have uh, the 30 constituents here in the index object. And uh, just as a repetition, so we can actually get uh, shares outstanding from a ticker object. So for example, for Apple. So first of all, we can get a lot of information with uh, get info. And uh, for example, we can get uh, the shares outstanding and once we have the shares, we can actually calculate uh, the market cap by multiplying with the price. And if we multiply here the current shares, not only with uh, the current price, 
but also with uh, past or historical prices, then we actually approximate uh, the historical market caps. So this is a simplified assumption that uh, the outstanding shares remain constant in that time period. So the outstanding shares that we can observe here today were the same in the last uh, two and a half years. And uh, in reality, that's typically not correct because shares outstanding typically change either due to a new share issuance or uh, through buybacks. So if the company buys back shares, then uh, the shares outstanding are getting reduced. And uh, so once again, here we explicitly assume that uh, shares outstanding uh, remain constant and that's an assumption, a simplified assumption approximation, but a pretty good one here. So this was uh, the example for one stock Apple. And now let's do the very same also for all 30 constituents. And uh, let's create here a data frame market cap where we want to collect uh, the historical market caps like we have here with uh, the prices. So now we have the prices but uh, later on the plan is to insert here the historical market caps. So this is kind of a dummy data frame. And now let's have here a little for loop. So we iterate over the symbols and uh, for each and every symbol, we actually retrieve uh, the current shares outstanding and we assume that uh, these shares outstanding remain constant and uh, we actually calculate the uh, market cap over time and actually we overwrite here the prices in the dummy data frame MCAP. And finally we have all the historical market capitalizations in one data frame. So the approximations. And now let's simply run here the for loop. And now for example, we could select uh, the latest uh, data here, the latest data point. So the last row and sort actually uh, the uh, stocks by the market capitalization from high to low. And it's no surprise that by far the highest market cap we can find for Apple and also for Microsoft. And actually we can also visualize uh, this here in a pie chart. So we can use here plot.py and uh, this makes it even more clear that uh, we have a high concentration in Apple and in Microsoft. So these are the market caps here in the most uh, recent data point. And uh, so we also have all the other market caps. So for the last two and a half years and uh, with this we are ready to actually calculate uh, the value weighted index. And uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now we have the approximations for the historical market caps for all 30 constituents and uh, we can calculate the total market cap over time. So by simply summing up here MCAP. So this is uh, the total market cap of uh, the Dow Jones uh, index uh, constituents over time. And uh, we can also visualize this in a nice uh, price chart or value chart. And now to calculate uh, the value weighted index, first of all, we need to calculate uh, the weights of the constituents over time. And uh, we can do simply do this uh, with uh, the following code. So we divide uh, the M cap by the total M cap per row. And uh, this gives um, uh, the weights over time. So for example, for Apple, so the weight uh, at the end of August 2020 was uh, 23% and currently it's uh, 24%. And uh, just to make a cross check here, so the weights per row must sum up to one, which is uh, the case here. And then we can also visualize uh, the weights over time for the 30 constituents. And it's no surprise here that uh, we have a high concentration in two stocks. So we have Apple and uh, we have Microsoft here with Orange and uh, the weights for all other 28 constituents are below 5%. Now to calculate uh, the value weighted index, it's important to understand uh, the following. So we still have saved here the daily returns and uh, the weights, so the daily weights. 
And to get uh, the value weighted index, we need to calculate uh, the market cap weighted returns. So we need to weight uh, the returns by the market cap weights. And actually the weights are based on uh, closing prices and uh, market caps at the end of uh, the day. So these are the weights at the end of the day and actually apply for the next day. And uh, this means to calculate uh, the weighted average returns. So for example, for the 1st of September, so if you want to calculate the weighted average here, then we have to use uh, the returns of the 1st of September, but uh, weighted with uh, the weights at uh, the end of the previous day. So this is how it works and therefore coding wise, we have to add here shift, the shift method. So we have to shift uh, the weights by one row and then we can calculate uh, the weighted average returns weighted uh, by the market cap weights. So we select the, the returns of the constituents and multiply the returns by uh, the weights and uh, then we sum up per row to get uh, the uh, weighted average returns, so the market cap weighted returns. And once again, these are simple returns. And now to calculate uh, the index, so the normalized price uh, with a base of 100, we have to add one and calculate uh, the cumulative product and then multiply with 100. So that's it. So here we have uh, the value weighted index uh, with a base uh, value of 100 at uh, the end of August 2020. And finally, we give a name here to the Panda series, so value weighted index. And uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, we have calculated uh, the three indexes with different weighting schemes. And now let's compare the performance of uh, the three indexes. So let's concatenate uh, the three Panda series and let's create the merge data frame indices. So here we have the value weighted index, the price weighted index and uh, the equal weighted index. And all three indexes start uh, at the end of August 2020 with a base value of 100. And then finally we end up uh, at 111 for the value weighted index and 118 for the other two indexes. So it seems uh, that uh, the value weighted index underperformed here relative uh, to the other two indexes. And uh, we can also create the price charts here and uh, compare. So in blue we have uh, the value weighted index and uh, we can see here that uh, the value weighted index underperformed and uh, the other two are moving closely together. And actually the reason for this is uh, that uh, the value weighted index is more concentrated. So here we have two concentrated positions in Apple and Microsoft and uh, the other two indexes are better diversified or more diversified. But uh, we should keep in mind here the following. So we have learned that uh, the value weighted index and uh, the price weighted index are mostly self rebalancing. However, the equal weighted index requires and assumes daily rebalancing and uh, this means uh, trading costs typically. And in the next lecture we will conduct a more detailed analysis and comparison. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now we still have saved the data frame indices uh, with uh, the three indexes and uh, normalized prices based on uh, the 31st of uh, August 2020 and uh, we still have saved the close prices for all 30 constituents and uh, the Dow Jones index. And now to conduct a larger comparison, uh, we should or could match uh, those two data frames with the pandas.concatenate and uh, we create uh, the match data frame prices matched. So here we have the constituents and also the indexes here on the right. And now to compare the performance, uh, we have to calculate uh, the returns. So for example, the simple returns here for the 30 constituents and also for the uh, three indexes. And then we can actually calculate uh, the annualized risk and return for all 30 constituents and uh, the indexes with uh, the little helper function annualized risk and return. And uh, this function assumes uh, that uh, we pass here a data frame with uh, simple returns and what uh, the function actually does. 
So it calculates uh, the annualized risk, assuming 252 trading days. And it also calculates uh, the compound annual growth rate. And then it returns to the summary data frame. So let's do this here. And here we have the risk and uh, the return for all 30 constituents and also for our three indexes. And uh, to compare all those instruments, it's just best uh, to visualize uh, risk and return in a mean variance uh, framework here. So risk return analysis. And here we can see the price weighted index and uh, the equal weighted index. So they have more or less uh, the very same risk return profile. So at least in our case here, but uh, this of course can be different in other cases. And then we can spot uh, the value weighted index here. So it's getting clear that uh, the value weighted index has more risk and a lower return than the other two indexes. So it clearly underperforms uh, the other two indexes. And uh, what we actually can conclude here that all three indexes benefit from the portfolio diversification effect. So while uh, the return is more or less uh, the weighted average of the constituents, the risk is actually far less uh, than the weighted average. And uh, this is uh, the so-called portfolio diversification effect. And uh, we will go a lot more into the details in the next sections. And then we can also conclude uh, that uh, the concentrated positions in Microsoft and Apple actually in this case negatively affect uh, the value weighted index. So more risk and uh, also less return here. Now we can conclude uh, that uh, the price weighted index and uh, the equal weighted index are closely together, but uh, this is before trading costs. And uh, we should keep in mind here that uh, the equal weighted index requ requires daily rebalancing while the price weighted index is more or less self rebalancing. So we uh, did not take into account here trading costs uh, for the equal weighted index. But uh, typically if you rebalance a portfolio on a daily basis, then uh, this uh, triggers a lot of uh, trading costs. So the true or the real uh, compound annual growth rate of uh, the equal weighted index should be lower. So somewhere here. And uh, we will continue with another aspect in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. So far we have ignored dividends and uh, therefore we have calculated uh, the price return indexes. But uh, to get uh, the true performance, we should actually take into account dividends as well. And uh, this is also referred to total return. So an index uh, that takes into account price returns and dividends is a total return index. And actually we could calculate uh, the total return variant for all uh, three weighting schemes. But for now, let's stick to the Dow Jones index weighting scheme, which is the price weighting. And let's calculate the Dow Jones the total return index. And it's actually a bit more complex as uh, we can't just sum up the prices. So we need to use uh, the more general way of calculating indexes. So by weighting uh, the returns. And still the weighting in the price weighted indexes by the prices and uh, we still have saved uh, the weights of uh, the price weighted index based on the close prices. So this doesn't change here. But now instead of weighting uh, the price returns, we have to weight uh, the total returns taken from uh, the adjusted uh, close prices. So now let's calculate the total returns using here the adjusted close prices. And uh, then once again, we can actually weight uh, the total returns by the weights. And also here, we shouldn't forget to use uh, shift. And uh, this gives us the returns of uh, the total return index. And then we can convert uh, the returns into a normalized prices. So with add one comprot and then uh, using a base value of 100. So that's uh, the Dow Jones total return index starting again at a base value of 100 at the end of August 2020. And finally, to compare the performance uh, with uh, the constituents and the other indexes, so the price indexes, we can also add here the uh, Dow Jones uh, total returns to the merged uh, returns data frame. So 
So here on the very right, we have uh, the returns of the total return index. And uh, with uh, this, uh, we can once again create uh, the summary data frame with uh, the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. And already here, if we compare the total return index with its uh, price return index, so the risk is uh, the very same, but uh, the return is higher, so 10% compared to 8%. And uh, the difference is uh, simply the uh, dividend yield. Finally, let's also create uh, the risk return chart. So now here we have uh, the Dow Jones the price return index and here the total return index. And uh, here the difference is uh, just uh, the dividend payments, but uh, the risk is actually the same. And uh, with this we have reached uh, the end of uh, the section. So now you are able to actually calculate uh, six different indexes. So you can calculate or create an equal weighted index, a price weighted index and a value weighted index. And uh, for all uh, three indexes, you actually have uh, the choice between uh, the price return index and uh, the total return index. Thanks for watching and see you in the next section. Bye. In the last section, we have learned how to build a stock index. And uh, the question is now, how can we as investors benefit from stock indices? And uh, this question uh, leads us to ETF investing and index replication. And uh, some of you might ask whether we can directly invest in a stock index. So for example, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And uh, the answer is no, but uh, you can buy an ETF, so an exchange traded fund that actually replicates or tracks uh, the index. And uh, as an example for the Dow Jones Index, we have, uh, for example, the ETF iShares Dow Jones Industrial Average. And actually iShares is uh, the brand of uh, one provider, but uh, there are many different providers or managers of uh, ETF funds. So iShares is just uh, one example here. And now let me explain in more detail what an ETF is. So like any other fund, uh, the exchange uh, traded fund is a type of uh, a pooled investment. And in this case, it's a pooled investment uh, security that uh, buys and sells other instruments. So typically stocks, but it can also be fixed income, commodities and more. And that's uh, the most important point here. So the ETF is traded on stock exchanges itself. So you can buy and sell shares of an ETF like for any other regular stock. And that's uh, the difference to uh, mutual funds. So typically mutual funds are not uh, tradable throughout the day. And actually an ETF uh, typically invests passively and uh, follows or tracks an index, but uh, there do exist also active ETFs. So that take active investment decisions. Now, like any other managed fund, uh, an ETF uh, triggers and includes management fees and also license fees for uh, the uh, index uh, creator. But typically fees for ETFs are rather low. So as an approximation, typically uh, 0.1 or 0.2, 0.25% per year. So that's a typical fee, ongoing fee for an ETF fund. And typically an ETF is open-end and uh, this means uh, there are no limits on time and no limits on the number of investors. And uh, finally, we not only can find uh, stock ETFs, but also fixed income ETFs, commodity ETFs, and uh, mixed asset class ETFs and more. Now let's come to ETF investing versus uh, direct stock investing and uh, the differences and actually what is better and most important, uh, with a given investment budget, ETF investing allows higher diversification. So the lower the budget, the more favorable ETF investing. And uh, just as an example, so let's assume you buy one share of an S&P 500 ETF for $100, then uh, this allows you to invest in many stocks uh, with just $100. So in this case, 500. And uh, the alternative would be to actually buy single stocks for $100. Uh, 
and uh, probably uh, you won't buy more than one, two or three stocks for 100 US dollar. So in a nutshell, ETFs uh, simplify passive portfolio investing and uh, diversified investing. And once again, the lower the investment budget, the more favorable are the ETFs. Now cost-wise, uh, there's a trade-off between higher initial costs uh, with direct investing. So if you buy all stocks separately, then uh, typically this triggers a lot of uh, initial costs. But uh, on the other hand side, so ETF has higher ongoing fees. So the annual management fees. And uh, this is clearly a trade-off here. And uh, as a rule of thumb, so the higher your investment budget, then the more favorable the direct investment. Now taxation can differ between ETF investment and direct uh, stock investment, but uh, this is uh, clearly not a cause on taxation and I can't uh, give any tax advice here. So you have to check that on your own. So depending on uh, your location and uh, your circumstances. And uh, typically if you directly invest in stocks, then you have uh, the voting rights, but if you invest indirectly, so via an ETF, then typically you have either no voting rights or at least no direct or independent voting rights. So typically the ETF management has uh, the voting rights and acts according uh, to uh, guidelines. Now, finally, even if you want to invest uh, via ETFs, so for some indices or for some investment strategies, there simply do not exist appropriate ETFs in the market. So to sum up, uh, there are pros and cons for both. But if you decide to invest directly and replicate uh, the index in your portfolio, then uh, this is also called index tracking. And uh, we will continue with index replication and index tracking in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. So you can either buy an ETF that tracks the index or you replicate the index, also called index tracking. And actually what uh, the ETF manager does is nothing else than index replication. And uh, there are two different approaches. So we have uh, physical replication and uh, synthetic uh, replication. And an ETF that physically replicates an index simply holds uh, the stocks or the, uh, the securities of the index. And in contrast to that, an ETF that selects uh, synthetic uh, replication holds derivatives. So for example, futures or swaps. Now there are pros and cons for the synthetic approach. So whenever you invest in derivatives, you actually assume counterparty risk. So of a bank or a financial institution, and uh, this makes it more complex and more intransparent. But on the other hand side, costs can be slightly lower and the tracking quality can be better. So it can potentially track uh, the index more closely. But most retail investors clearly prefer the physical replication. And here in this course, uh, we will focus on the physical replication. Now there do exist different replication methods and uh, the most simple one is uh, full replication followed by stratified sampling and uh, the most complex one is optimization. And uh, typically if an index consists of uh, less than 1000 stocks and if all stocks are liquid and available in the market, then full replication is preferred. So full replication means holding all stocks uh, with uh, the uh, corresponding index weights. And uh, this typically leads uh, to the lowest uh, tracking error. So we will cover the tracking error in the very next slide. Now in case an index has a lot of uh, stocks, so for example, more than uh, 1000, or if an index uh, contains illiquid ones or not available ones, then an ETF can't efficiently invest in all stocks. And then it just invests in a sample. And whenever you take a sample, it uh, should be a representative sample. 
And uh, this is also referred to stratified sampling. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the sample is uh, representative by categories like uh, the company size, uh, the industry, the region or the country or whatever. Finally, we have optimization and uh, optimization tries to track the index in terms of performance as closely as possible and it uses uh, mathematical tools and also statistical methods. So there do exist a couple of optimization uh, methods and uh, we will cover one example in this section. And uh, the overall goal of index replication, so not only of uh, the optimization method, is actually to minimize uh, the index tracking error. Now leading to the question, so what's uh, the tracking error and how can we measure the quality of uh, index tracking? So let's assume that uh, this is here the target benchmark. So the returns of uh, the index here are in the middle. So these are the returns of the index and our tracking portfolio should actually hit here the benchmark. So the returns should hit here in the middle of uh, the bullseye and uh, the optimal outcome of index tracking is as follows. So the optimal outcome is uh, that uh, we have a low active return and a low tracking error. And uh, this is the case here. So on average, uh, the tracking portfolio returns are close or equal to the index returns. And also the volatility is low. So all points here are in the bullseye. And uh, we will calculate uh, the active return and uh, the tracking error in the next coding lectures. But here's already the definition. So the active return is uh, the tracking uh, portfolio returns in excess of uh, the benchmark or index returns. So it's simply the tracking portfolio returns minus uh, the index returns, so the difference. And uh, having the active returns, so then we can calculate uh, the tracking error and uh, the tracking error is uh, the annualized standard deviation of active returns. So to say the volatility of uh, the tracking and uh, the tracking error is also called active risk or tracking risk. Now let's have a look at two other possible outcomes of index tracking. So once again, here's uh, the target. And now we have here the following situation that uh, we have a high active return so uh, the average uh, return deviates from the benchmark or index, but uh, the volatility of the deviation or the difference is low. So we have here a high active return and a low tracking error. And uh, the high active return can be positive or negative. So it can be higher or lower than the benchmark. And of course, a positive active return is better than a negative active return. But uh, in index tracking, uh, the active return should be close to zero actually. And now let's have a look at uh, the third example. So once again, here we have the target and uh, this time we have actually a low active return. So on average, uh, these points are in the bullseye or close to the bullseye, but uh, the volatility is uh, rather high. So here we have a low active return and a high tracking error. And a high tracking error is always an indication for poor tracking quality. And now let's see this live in action in our coding sessions. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, let's analyze an index and one of its ETFs uh, that tracks or replicates uh, the index. And uh, the S&P 500 index, so standard and Poor's 500, is uh, the perfect example for full replication because in the S&P 500 index, we can find uh, 500 uh, large US stocks. So very liquid and highly available stocks. And actually, in fact, it's uh, 503 stocks because it includes uh, two share classes of stock from uh, three of its uh, components. So in a nutshell, 503 stocks from 500 companies. And actually the S&P 500 uh, is not only one of the most commonly followed equity indices in the US, so it's actually uh, the equity index. So typically metrics like uh, the beta factor are relative uh, to the S&P 500 index. 
And uh, the S&P 500 index is a market capitalization weighted index and it includes major parts of uh, the listed equity market in the US. So in terms of market capitalization, however, the downturn is uh, that uh, the S&P 500 is also concentrated. So the nine largest companies uh, accounted for almost 30% of uh, the index here. And these are the stocks with the highest weights. So no surprise here. And uh, now let's start coding and we need Y Finance, Pandas, NumPy and Matplotlib. And uh, we need uh, the ticker symbol for the S&P 500 index. And uh, for the price index, uh, the symbol is uh, GSPC. And on Yahoo Finance, all indexes start uh, with a circumflex. So this is uh, the ticker symbol for the uh, price return index. And uh, this is uh, the symbol for the total return index. And finally, we also need an ETF uh, that tracks uh, the index. And uh, we have here S, P, Y, and I've provided here a link. So it's from uh, State Street Global Advisors. And actually this S&P 500 ETF trust is uh, quite large. So it has uh, 381 billion under management. And uh, here you can see actually the cross expense ratio. So to say the management fees and uh, it's actually per year 0.1%, which is uh, quite efficient here. So here are the key features and uh, the ETF uh, seeks to provide uh, investment results before expenses that correspond generally to the price and dividend yield performance of the S&P 500 index. So, and here's some more fund information. And for example, here the ETF fund distributes dividends on a quarterly basis. So it uh, distributes dividends and therefore there's no reinvestment of dividends. And I said before that uh, this is an example for full replication. So here we have the fund characteristics and in total we have all shares. So 503 holdings. And here you can see the fund performance also compared to the index and uh, the holdings. So Apple, Microsoft and so on. Now let's go back and now we can actually load uh, historical price and uh, volume with uh, Yahoo Finance. So for the index, then for the total return index and also for the ETF. So ending at the end of uh, November 2022. And first of all, of course, uh, we have to run here the cell and now we can do it. So here we have the data frame with uh, the uh, three instruments and uh, adjusted close, high, low, close prices and so on. And uh, first of all, let's drop some rows uh, with the uh, missing values. And then let's decide to focus on uh, the close price. And uh, then we also add uh, the adjusted close prices for the ETF. So this is an approximation for the total return. So here we have uh, the index prices and uh, the index adjusted uh, prices. So the total, so to say the total return prices. And here on the left, we have uh, the ETF prices and uh, the adjusted close prices for the ETF. And then we can normalize prices. So this makes it easier to compare so we start uh, at the end of January 1993 with a base value of 1. And uh, then for the close prices, we end up at 9.15 and 9.17. And uh, for the adjusted close prices uh, with uh, 16.45 for uh, the index and 15.88 uh, for the ETF. So it seems so that uh, the total return of the index is slightly higher than the total return of the ETF. And uh, we can also visualize and compare the ETF price with uh, the price uh, return index. So they move closely together 
And uh, the same you can also do for the total returns. So the A ATF total return and uh, the S&P 500 total return index. And here we can see a small gap. So the total return is slightly higher for the index. And uh, we can further zoom here in into the year 2022, for example. And here we can clearly see the difference between the index and uh, the ETF. And now we can also measure the performance uh, with uh, some numbers. And uh, first of all, we have to calculate uh, the uh, returns. So the simple returns. And uh, with uh, this, we can calculate uh, the annualized uh, risk return. So the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. So let's create here the summary data frame. And uh, the price returns are closely together. So 7.7%. .7 but uh, there is a difference here in the total return. So the index has a total return of 9.85% and uh, the ETF has a total return of 9.72. So there's around about 0.1% difference in the total return. And uh, this is uh, due to the ETF fees. So let's recap that ETF fees are per year round about 0.1%. And actually as uh, the price returns are more or less uh, the same, so we can uh, observe that uh, the management fees are deducted from dividends. So the dividends are reduced by the management fees. And in the next lecture, we will analyze how good or how closely the ETF attracts the index and uh, as uh, we are faced here with uh, full replication, so we could assume that uh, the tracking is uh, pretty good, but uh, we will see in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now let's measure the tracking quality of uh, our ETF. And uh, there are actually two metrics how we can measure the tracking quality. So we have uh, the active return and uh, the tracking error also referred to tracking risk or active risk. And actually calculating the active return and the tracking error is pretty simple. So the active return is simply the return differences between the ETF in this case and uh, the index. And uh, then the tracking error is uh, the standard deviation of active returns. And typically we use uh, the annualized the standard deviation and also the active return annualized as uh, compound uh, annual growth rate. And uh, perfect tracking quality means uh, zero active return and uh, zero tracking error. And uh, you can see here the graphical analogy here. So returns of uh, the ETF are pretty much identical to the index returns. And if uh, this is uh, the case, uh, we have low active return and uh, low tracking error. So this is uh, the desired outcome. But otherwise, uh, we could also have uh, high active returns. So either positive or negative and a low tracking error or a low active return and a high tracking error. And uh, the fourth case uh, would be a high active return and a high tracking error. And typically actively managed funds so for example, that uh, try to beat an index have uh, typically a high active return, so positive or negative, and also a high tracking error. Now we still have saved uh, the active returns for uh, the ETF and also for the index. And now let's uh, split them up into uh, the price returns. So for the index and uh, the ETF and uh, the total returns. And now let's create a little helper function that allow us to calculate actually the tracking error and uh, the active return. So the function tracking and uh, here we have to pass a returns data frame with uh, simple returns and uh, we have to pass here the index name. And then in a first step we simply calculate uh, the return difference between uh, the ETF and uh, the index, so active returns. And then we create a summary data frame. And uh, then uh, we actually calculated the standard deviation of active returns annualized, which is actually the tracking error. And finally, we also annualize uh, the active return. 
So the compound annual growth rate and uh, then the function returns so the summary data frame. And now let's start with the price returns and let's calculate here the tracking between the ETF and the S&P 500 index. So here we have, first of all, the tracking results of the index with itself. And it's clear, getting clear here that by definition, so the active return and the tracking error of the index is zero. So by definition, and then we have a tracking error of 3.5% for the ETF and an active return of very close to zero here. So this was so the price return and now let's move on with so the total return and uh, the tracking error here is in the very same range but uh, the active return is uh, negative here so minus 0.14% and once again uh, the negative active return of minus 0.14% is mainly due to the ETF fees. So to sum up, the ETF shows a tracking error of close to zero. And uh, this is no surprise because we have full replication, but uh, still the tracking error is not exactly zero for a couple of practical reasons. So for example, an ETF is uh, never fully invested. So there's also some cash reserves and other practical issues, uh, but a tracking error of uh, 3.4 or 5% is uh, pretty close here to zero. But once again, we have uh, the ETF fees that are getting deducted uh, from the dividends. And uh, this is uh, clearly the major difference between uh, the ETF and uh, buying the stocks separately. So thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. Now let's have a look at another example, the Russell 3000 index that is even broader than the S&P 500 as it contains uh, the 3000 largest publicly held companies in the US and it uh, represents approximately 97% of uh, the American public equity market. So let's start from scratch here and we need Y-Finance, Pandas, NumPy and Matplotlib. And uh, then we have uh, the Yahoo Finance uh, ticker symbol for the index which is R U A and uh, the ticker symbol for the uh, total return index. And then we have for the ETF iShares Russell 3000 uh, ETF. And uh, this is an example for representative sampling. And uh, the ticker symbol is I W V and uh, we can go to uh, the homepage of uh, this ETF. So the iShares Russell 3000 ETF. And here we can see that the expense ratio is 0.20%. So higher than we have seen for the S&P 500. And it's no surprise that the ETF seeks to track here the index. And if we check here the difference between the total return of the ETF and the benchmark, then we can see here the difference, which is... Uh, quite equal to the expense ratio. And typically expenses are deducted from dividends. So if we uh, check here, so also this ETF distributes uh, dividends on a quarterly basis. And once again, the iShares Russell 3000 ETF uses uh, representative sampling. So number of holdings is only 2,580. So in total in the index, uh, there are 3,000 stocks but uh, here we only have 2,500 and uh, we can check this in more detail here if we go to the prospectus, summary prospectus and uh, there we can read. The investment objectives and the investment strategy and here it says so that it uses a representative sampling and uh, the fund generally will invest at least in 80% of uh, the assets of the underlying index. And now let's simply analyze and compare the ETF and the index. So let's load the data from Yahoo Finance. So for the index, uh, the ETF and uh, the total return index, 
And unfortunately, so here for the total return index, we don't have the data, so the historical data. So we have only the latest data from uh, the latest uh, business or the most current business day. And on Yahoo Finance, uh, this happens quite often that uh, we don't have historical data for uh, the uh, total return variance. So it doesn't make sense here to load the total return index as well. But uh, we have seen before that in terms of total return, so there is a return difference between uh, the index and uh, the ETF. And it's uh, around about in the same range as uh, the expense ratio. So now we have uh, the ETF and uh, the index, so the price return index. And uh, we can drop some missing values and get uh, the close prices. And then we can normalize. And actually both uh, start here at a base value of one in May 2000 and here now at the end of November 2022. So we have uh, 3.08 for the ETF and 3.10 for the index. So they are closely together, but still there is a very small negative active return of the ETF. And we will see this later, but now let's just uh, visualize the normalized prices. So in orange, the index and in blue, the ETF. And uh, we can zoom in into one year. And here we can even better see the difference here. So the small difference. And then we can also calculate simple returns and calculate uh, the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. So the annualized risk is almost the same. And here in the compound annual growth rate, we can see a small negative active return. And uh, finally, we can also explicitly calculate the tracking error and the active return. And here we can see that also stratified sampling leads uh, to very low tracking errors. So only 2.7%. So let's uh, recap that uh, we only have 2,600 out of uh, 3,000 uh, constituents here in the ETF. And also we can see here a very small negative active return, but uh, the true negative active return we can see here when comparing the total return and uh, the total return of the benchmark, so approximately uh, 0.20%. So this was here the example on stratified sampling. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In this lecture, I will demonstrate how you can buy and sell ETF shares with the Interactive Brokers API. And as ETFs are very similar to ordinary shares, it works pretty much in the same way as trading stocks with the Interactive Brokers API. So there should not be anything new here compared to part one and it's more or less only a repetition. But now let's go through the code. And also here let's uh, start with uh, the following two disclaimers. So uh, the following code you should only run with your paper trading account and uh, you should check uh, the regular trading hours. So you simply can't trade on weekends or before or after the regular trading hours. At least uh, you shouldn't. And now let's uh, start here and uh, we import uh, the wrapper package and then we create a connection and uh, we do need here a connection uh, to uh, the trader workstation anyway. So if you haven't created a connection yet, then uh, you should do that. And uh, now let's assume that uh, we want to trade an S&P 500 ETF with uh, the ticker symbol S P Y and let's have a look again here. So currently I have no shares of uh, the ETF in my uh, account here. So let's save here the symbol. And first of all, we should check uh, whether there does exist a contract. And in the best case, it's an unambiguous contract. And uh, we can check this uh, with the request contract details. And in the best case, so we only have here one contract, which is uh, the case here. 
and then we can further check some more details of the contract. So the exchange is smart currency US dollar. And first of all, before we trade, we could try to request some market data with uh, request market data. And uh, we should keep in mind that whenever we get the message uh, that we can only pull delayed data, then we have to change uh, the market uh, data type to uh, three, which stands for delayed data. And then we can get uh, the current or slightly delayed market price. And then in the next step, we can create a market order object. So the plan is to buy one share. So the action is buy, so the site and uh, the total quantity is one share. And then we can actually place uh, the order with the uh, place order and uh, we wait until our order is filled or cancelled with uh, this code here. So let's run. And now let's check here the trade object. And we can actually, for example, check the status which is filled and also the average fill price which is 404.5 so pretty close here to the market price. And then for example, we can check all current positions with uh, positions. So I do have a couple of positions and then we can convert this into a data frame. And for example here, so this is now the ETF sitting on my account. And actually, once again, there's a difference between the average cost 405.5 and uh, the average fill price. And in this case, it's exactly one US dollar. And uh, the, re the reason for this is pretty simple. So in the average fill price, it's just uh, the price that we paid for the share. And uh, the average cost also includes paid commissions. And as uh, the commissions are here exactly one US dollar, we have here a difference of exactly one dollar between the average cost and uh, the average fill price. So to sum up, working with uh, ETF shares here on interactive brokers works pretty much in the same way as uh, with any other ordinary share and also trading works in the very same way. And finally, we should disconnect and uh, that's it actually. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. So far we have seen two examples of index replication. So one full replication and one with uh, certified sampling. And now let me demonstrate an example with optimization. And uh, the goal is actually to track uh, the S&P 500 index uh, with optimization. And in the end, it would be great to track the index with just uh, 50 or 100 stocks. And uh, the data requirements are quite extensive. So we need historical prices and also historical market caps for all 503 constituents because uh, the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. And we need Y Finance, Pandas, NumPy and uh, Matplotlib. And uh, the first challenge is to get all 503 constituents and their symbols. And uh, as we have learned before, so Wikipedia can help us here. And here's uh, the link uh, to the S&P 500 uh, site on Wikipedia. And uh, with this, we can get a table with all constituents and some more information. So the symbol, for example, and uh, the date added uh, to the index and uh, the full name and the more information on the sector and industry. And uh, we can also get here some more information with uh, the info method. So we have here five missing values in the date first edit column. And first of all, we should uh, rename here the column header to date edit without uh, white spaces or empty spaces. And then we should convert date edit to a date time data type and uh, let's check the most recent additions uh, to the index. So we can see here that uh, the constituents are getting removed and added on a regular basis, also called index uh, reconstitution. And uh, therefore we should keep in mind uh, that here the list uh, with uh, the 503 constituents are as of today. 
but some of them has been uh, recently added and uh, they didn't contribute uh, to uh, the historical index performance. So that's important to understand here. And uh, theoretically, uh, we would need to add removed ones as well to fully replicate uh, the past performance. But also here, we are reaching uh, the limits of uh, free data sources like Yahoo Finance. And it's always a trade-off between completeness of your data and accuracy of your analysis on the one hand side and the complexity and costs on the other hand side. But typically 95% completeness and accuracy is pretty good and to further increase it, we need to add an inappropriate amount of costs and complexity. So that's uh, the Pareto principle that says uh, that the last uh, 5% or so are the hardest and it's uh, questionable if it's uh, really worth it. So let's move on here with uh, the current 503 constituents of the S&P 500 index. And first of all, we can uh, create a list uh, with uh, the symbols. So we need uh, the list to actually load um, historical data from Yahoo Finance for all 503 symbols. And if you go here through the list, Then you might see that we have here a few symbols with special characters like a point or a dot. And uh, this doesn't work here on Yahoo Finance. And therefore, we have to replace uh, the point by a dash. And uh, we can do this with the string method replace. So this is here a list comprehension where we replace a point by a dot here in all elements of the list and we override actually the list. So now we have removed and replaced the point. And now we can also add uh, the index itself. So the S&P 500 index and now our symbols list uh, is complete. So with uh, the constituents and uh, the index and now we can actually download historical prices uh, with uh, yfinance.download and uh, we pass uh, the full list of uh, symbols. And actually you could run here the cell and download all 503 constituents and then select uh, the data from the year 2019 until today. But uh, to have uh, the very same data, I have provided here a CSV file with uh, the data so the S&P 500 constituent CSV. And now let's uh, work here with uh, the CSV file and uh, we save uh, the data frame in const, in the data frame const. So we have your data from the beginning of 2019 until the end of November, 2022. And uh, first of all, we should perform some data cleaning and preparation. So we can, for example, get um, the close prices so we have 504 columns. And then we should check uh, the symbols for number of missing values. So we use here a combination of is and a, so is missing value, sum and sort values and value counts to actually get an analysis of uh, number of missing values. So for 496 uh, symbols, we have zero missing values. Then in two cases, we have uh, 305 missing values. And then we have uh, so single cases here. And the plan is now to remove all symbols where we do not have sufficient data. So if we have a look here at uh, this analysis, then for example, we could say that we only want to keep here the 496 uh, symbols. And uh, we could do the following. So we can use drop an A and then uh, set access to one. So we want to drop all columns where we do have more than uh, one missing value. So the threshold is uh, the number of days minus one. So only uh, one missing value allowed. And uh, this leaves us here with 496 symbols. And then we could forward fill the remaining missing values. And then we can check again. And now we have for all 496 uh, symbols, uh, zero missing values. 
And then we can also save here the index and uh, the constituents, which are all other symbols other th than uh, the index. And finally, for the next lectures, we can also prepare the normalized prices. So this isn't anything new, starting with a base value of one at uh, the beginning of 2019. And then last but not least, we can also create uh, these simple returns. And uh, we will continue in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now in the next step, we need historical market uh, caps. And we have seen earlier in the course that we can get current market caps and current shares outstanding with uh, the Y Finance ticker object. So that's one option. And another option in particular for US listings is to load all listings from the NASDAQ uh, stock screener. And uh, here's uh, the link to uh, the NASDAQ uh, stock screener. And uh, here we have in total over 8,000 uh, US listings. So for example, Apple and uh, we have here the current market cap and uh, we can download here the CSV file by clicking here and uh, I've already done this. So I do provide uh, the CSV file NASDAQ listings.csv and uh, we can simply load uh, the data from the CSV file. So listings with uh, more than 8,000 rows here and 10 properties. And actually also here we have uh, the problem with uh, special characters for uh, some uh, ticker symbols and uh, here on NASDAQ we have forward slashes and uh, we have to replace uh, these with uh, dashes. So let's do this here. And now we only need uh, the 495 uh, constituents. So we filter listings uh, by the S&P 500 uh, constituents. So here we have 595 rows. And if we check here the info method, then we can see that uh, for one company, we do not have information on the current market cap. So we have one missing value here and uh, we can actually filter listings for the company where we don't have information on the market cap. So it's uh, the Brown Foreman Corporation. And therefore we can't uh, use it here unless we search for the market capitalization elsewhere. But uh, now let's simply remove here the ticker symbol so bf dash b so let's drop here the symbol from listings and also from the constituents list so before we had 495 and now we have 494 so let's uh, check again here listings and uh, to calculate uh, the shares outstanding we have to take into account uh, the last price and uh, the market cap and first of all we have to clean here the column last uh, sale so we have here a dollar sign and uh, to convert uh, this into numeric data we have to remove here the dollar sign first so replace uh, the dollar sign and then convert to numeric and then we create uh, the column price so a numeric column here on the right and uh, with the price and the market cap, uh, we can calculate uh, the shares outstanding. So the current shares outstanding by simply dividing the market cap by the price. And uh, we add to the column shares. So the number of shares outstanding here on the right. And then let's extract uh, the Panda series shares. So the shares outstanding and uh, then we can calculate uh, the market capitalization for all stocks over time. And also here it's important to understand uh, that uh, this is an approximation because we assume that the shares outstanding remain constant uh, since 2019, which is not the case uh, for all stocks, but it's a good approximation uh, to actually get uh, the right order of magnitude. And uh, to calculate uh, the market cap over time, we simply can uh, multiply the close prices uh, with uh, the shares outstanding. So now here we have uh, the data frame market cap over time for all 494 constituents. And actually we can check uh, the current market caps and uh, sort the companies or the stocks from high to low. And it's no surprise 
that uh, Apple and Microsoft uh, have uh, the highest market capitalizations, followed by Google and Amazon. And now on the next step, we can also calculate uh, the total market cap of uh, the S&P 500 index over time. And it's best to just uh, visualize this here. So this is the total market cap over time. And uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now, before we move on with constructing tracking portfolios, let's analyze how well single stocks can track uh, the S&P 500 index. So the tracking quality of single stocks and in total we have 494 single stocks and let's see how good uh, these stocks can track uh, the index and uh, we need uh, the single returns uh, which uh, we still have here and uh, then once again we have here the little helper function tracking that actually calculates uh, the annualized tracking error and uh, the annualized active return and it returns uh, the summary data frame and uh, we have to pass a returns data frame and uh, we have to specify the name of uh, the index. So we pass the returns and uh, the index is actually the S&P 500 index. And by doing so, we calculate the tracking error and the active return for all constituents and also for the index uh, itself. And it's no surprise that uh, there's uh, zero tracking error and uh, zero active return for the index. And now let's uh, actually sort the tracking errors from low to high. So we have here the index itself. And then we have uh, with, uh, the lowest tracking error, Berkshire Hathaway. So this is a company that actually invests in other companies. So it's no surprise that a company that is similar to a fund, so that invests in other companies, has uh, the best uh, tracking error here. And uh, then we have for the lowest tracking error, it's uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. So with a tracking error of 81% compared to 13% of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, we can also visualize uh, this. So we can compare the normalized prices of uh, the index, then Berkshire Hathaway and uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. So we have here in blue the index and in green Berkshire Hathaway with uh, the lowest tracking error and uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company with uh, the highest tracking error. And uh, while Berkshire Hathaway clearly co-moves here with uh, the index, so we can clearly see here that uh, there's hardly any correlation of uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company with uh, the index. So there's actually almost no link here. And we can summarize that even the best tracking single stock is not really great for index tracking. So still we have a tracking error of 13%. And to really track an index, we need a tracking portfolio. And that's the plan for the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, let's start with the tracking portfolio example. And in total, we have a set of 494 stocks. And for example, let's pick 50 stocks. So only 10% of the total index to create a tracking portfolio. So 50 stocks in the tracking portfolio. And uh, there are actually two major ways how we can create a sample. So we can either create a representative sample with a stratified sampling, which is of course more complex, or we can simply create a random sample. And the random sampling is pretty simple with NumPy and uh, the method np.random.choice. And we have to pass uh, the full set of uh, symbols to the A parameter and uh, the size of the sample to the size parameter. And now it's important to set false to the replace parameter. And otherwise, if we set the replace to true, then uh, we have sampling with replacement, which means uh, that uh, we could have a stock multiple times in our sample, which is actually not desired here in our case. And finally, we should uh, set a random seed. So for example, the number one, two, three, and uh, this allows uh, reproducibility. So as long as uh, you set uh, the very same seed, so one, two, three, then you should get uh, the very same random samples. 
And now let's create uh, the random sample and let's save uh, the random sample in uh, the variable tracking stocks. So here we have 50 symbols. And once we have uh, the tracking stocks, uh, we can calculate uh, their market cap weights in the tracking portfolio. So we can simply filter the MCAP data frame by the tracking stocks and actually calculate uh, the weights over time. So this isn't anything new here. So now we have here a data frame with the weights and 50 columns and uh, 983 days. So these are the weights of uh, the tracking portfolio. And having the weights, uh, we can calculate uh, the daily returns of uh, the tracking portfolio. So we filter returns by the tracking stocks and multiply with uh, the shifted weights. So also this isn't anything new here. And uh, these are the daily returns, so the simple returns of uh, the tracking portfolio. And uh, with this, we can actually calculate uh, the active returns. So the difference between uh, the tracking portfolio returns and uh, the index returns. And then to calculate uh, the tracking error, we have to uh, calculate uh, the standard deviation of the active returns. And finally, we can annualize uh, the tracking error by multiplying with uh, the square root of 252 trading days per year. And uh, this is now the final tracking error. So the annualized tracking error of uh, the sample portfolio 5.5%, uh, which is uh, pretty good. But still, let's keep in mind uh, that uh, this is only one random sample portfolio. And uh, now let's analyze uh, this process here, for example, 1000 times. So 1000 times uh, we simulate uh, the process of getting a random portfolio of 50 stocks and then we calculate uh, the tracking error of uh, the uh, tracking portfolio. So let's simulate 1000 times. And then first of all, and once again, we set here the random seed and then we collect uh, the tracking errors of uh, the 1000 simulations in uh, the list tracking errors and uh, then 1000 times we actually make the very same calculation as before. So first of all, we create a random sample, then we calculate the weights, then the tracking portfolio returns, and uh, finally uh, the tracking error. And uh, we append each and every tracking error to the list of tracking errors. And finally, we calculate uh, the mean uh, tracking error. So the mean over 1000 simulations and then we have uh, the average uh, tracking error or the expected uh, tracking error if uh, we select a sample size of 50. So this is uh, the average or the expected tracking error for a uh, sample size of 50. So let's simply run here and this takes a couple of seconds. And now let's check uh, the average tracking error. So while we could observe a tracking error of 5.5% in the first simulation, so over 1000 simulations, the, the average uh, tracking error is here 7.4%. And uh, the question is now, can we further decrease uh, the tracking error if we increase uh, the sample size? And that's exactly the question uh, that uh, we try to answer in the next lecture. So thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have seen that the average or the expected tracking error for a tracking portfolio with portfolio size 50 is 7.4%. And now the question is, does the sample size matter? And is there any relationship between sample size and tracking error? And intuitively, the relationship should be as follows. So the larger the sample size, the lower the tracking error. But let's further analyze this with some more advanced Python simulations. And uh, the goal is now to perform the very same analysis for different uh, sample sizes. So for example, for sample size 1, 11, 21, 31, and so on. And uh, again, and still we have 494 constituents. And we could create a set of sample sizes that we want to analyze so with uh, the range uh, object. So for example, 1, 11, 21, until 491. And actually as uh, this uh, requires more computational power, we should uh, reduce uh, the simulations per size here. So for example, 100 simulations for each and every 
size should be sufficient to actually get the relationship, sort of the general relationship. And then once again, we set a random seed for reproducibility. And uh, then we have here the two for loops, so to say a nested for loop. And uh, we check for each and every size actually uh, the expected uh, tracking error. And uh, this should be familiar here. So for each and uh, every size, we actually run 100 simulations and calculate 100 tracking errors. And then we calculate uh, the mean tracking error and depend it uh, to the average uh, tracking errors. So in the end, uh, we should have for each and every portfolio size one average uh, tracking error. And now let's simply run here the nested for loop and uh, this could take a while actually. And now let's check uh, the average uh, tracking errors. So here we start uh, with uh, the average or expected tracking error. If uh, we only have one stock in the tracking portfolio, then this is uh, the expected uh, tracking error for 11 stocks, then for 21, 31, 41, 51, and so on. And uh, obviously there is a relationship. So the larger the sample size, uh, the lower the tracking error. And it's just best to uh, visualize uh, this. So we actually plot uh, the portfolio sizes here on the x-axis and uh, the corresponding average tracking errors on the y-axis. So here we have the tracking error and uh, the portfolio sizes from 1 till 490 something. And actually it's in fact the case that the larger the sample size, the better the tracking quality. So we can minimize the tracking error if we just increase the portfolio size. And it's also getting clear that the marginal benefits of adding more stocks to the sample is decreasing. So if we increase the portfolio size from one to maybe 20 or 30, then we can significantly reduce the tracking error but if we further increase the size from 30 to 500, then the decrease in the tracking error is a lot lower. So decreasing marginal benefits. And uh, the question is now what's uh, the right portfolio size? And uh, there's actually no right or wrong because there's always the trade-off between minimizing the portfolio size and minimizing the tracking error. And it's reasonable to select a portfolio size here when the graph uh, is getting flatter. So when uh, the marginal benefit uh, decreases. So somewhere here between maybe 50 and uh, 200. And I will demonstrate an example in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have seen that we can significantly reduce the tracking error with a sample size of 30, 50, or even 100. And now let's assume that our target is to bring the expected tracking error below 5%. And this means that the sample size should be at least around about 110. So we could set the sample size to 110. And still we have in total 449 constituents. And now let's create 10,000 random portfolios with 110 stocks and let's find the best tracking one. And this means finding the portfolio with the lowest tracking error. And once again, we set here a random seed and we set initial values for the minimum tracking error. So 100%, then we want to collect the tracking stocks for the uh, best uh, tracking portfolio and uh, the normalized prices for the best tracking portfolio. So initial values are here none. And then we repeat uh, the following process uh, 10,000 times. So we create a random sample with sample size 110. Then we calculate uh, the weights, the returns of the tracking portfolio, then the active returns, then the tracking error, and then the normalized prices of the tracking portfolio. And then at the end, uh, we check whether the tracking error of uh, this portfolio is uh, lower than the current minimum tracking error. And if uh, this is uh, the case, 
then uh, we overwrite here the minimum tracking error and uh, the uh, tracking stocks and also the tracking portfolio. So this allows us to find uh, the best uh, portfolio out of uh, 10,000 uh, random portfolios. And now let's simply run here the simulation. And uh, now let's check uh, the tracking error of uh, the best portfolio. And uh, this is quite low, so we have 3.2% uh, and we can also get uh, the set of tracking stocks. So these are in total 100 stocks in our tracking portfolio. And finally, we can also check here the normalized prices of our tracking portfolio. So at the beginning of 2019, we start here with a base value of one. And then at the end of 2022, we end up at 1.62. And let's give here a name to this Panda series. And now we can actually plot uh, the tracking portfolio and uh, the index and compare. And here, so in blue, we have uh, the tracking portfolio with uh, 110 stocks. And in green, we have uh, the index. And uh, we can clearly see that uh, the tracking portfolio tracks uh, the index uh, very closely. So this is uh, a pretty good uh, tracking performance. And we could also further measure the tracking performance. So let's add here the tracking portfolio to the normalized data frame. And once again, let's define here the tracking function. And let's pass here the uh, returns of the normalized data frame and the index. And uh, with uh, this, we can actually compare all stocks and also our tracking portfolio in terms of tracking error and active return. And uh, here we can see, so the tracking portfolio has a tracking error of 3.2% uh, and uh, the active return is slightly positive because here at the end, uh, the tracking portfolio has a slightly higher multiple. So the tracking error is pretty low and also the active return is uh, close to zero with 0.2% uh, uh, and uh, this is a great result. But we have to keep in mind here the following. So, so far we optimized uh, with historical data and then we tested uh, the tracking quality in sample on the very same historical data. But uh, what we are actually interested in is uh, whether the tracking portfolio tracks uh, the index uh, well also in the future. So we can't benefit uh, from a great uh, tracking quality in the past or in sample. And uh, the problem with uh, this approach is uh, that uh, very likely we overestimate uh, the tracking quality. And uh, the better approach is now to also test uh, the tracking quality on future out sample data. And uh, this is also called forward testing. And uh, we will perform optimization and out sample testing in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have learned that we should test uh, the tracking quality of our tracking portfolio on out sample data. And uh, this is also called forward testing. And now we could either wait weeks or months until we have sufficient data to make an outsample test, or we simply split uh, the historical data period into two sub periods. So the optimization period and uh, the testing period. And in the optimization period, we try to find the optimal tracking portfolio. And uh, then in, a te in the testing period, we test uh, the outsample performance of uh, the tracking portfolio and uh, the outsample performance is uh, the more realistic performance if you want uh, an estimation for the future performance of uh, the tracking portfolio. And uh, we still have the full data set from 2019 until November 2022. And uh, we could split the data somewhere in the middle. So for example, in uh, June 2021. So we have here the optimization period from 2019 until June 2021 and then uh, the testing period from July 2021 until the end of uh, 2022. And uh, with the start and the end, uh, we can actually filter any uh, time series data frame. So like for example, the market cap data frame. So from the start to the end. So in this case, from the beginning of 2019 
until the end of June 2021. And now let's perform the optimization on data from 2019 until mid of 2021. And uh, still we stick here to uh, the sample size of 110 stocks. And we pass uh, the optimization start to uh, the variable start and uh, the optimization end to the variable end. And now this is essentially the very same code as uh, before, but now when it comes uh, to selecting here data in uh, data frames, then we use here the log operator or accessor from the start to the end and the tracking stocks. And also here returns from the start to the end using the tracking stocks. And once again with this, uh, we can find uh, the best portfolio out of uh, 10,000 uh, portfolios. And uh, this time in the time period 219 until 2021. So let's run here the optimization. And now let's have a look at uh, the minimum tracking error. So it's 3.0%, uh, but uh, we should keep in mind that this is based on an in-sample test and uh, this is maybe not uh, the realistic number for the forward looking tracking error of uh, that portfolio. And then we can also check here the stocks. So we have here 110 stocks in our tracking portfolio. And then we also have the normalized prices of uh, the tracking portfolio. And let's give a name here to the Panda series. And now let's concatenate normalized prices of the tracking portfolio and of uh, the index from start to end and uh, we save it in the variable opt. So both are starting here at uh, the beginning of 2019 with a base value of 1 and uh, they end here very closely. So we have uh, 1.69 versus 1.71. So it seems that uh, the tracking portfolio has a slightly negative uh, active return and uh, we can also make the corresponding plot here so they closely move together. And we can also measure the tracking error and uh, the active return. So we have an active return of minus 0.2% and a tracking error of uh, 3%. But again, these metrics are based on an in-sample test and now it's uh, better to actually also perform an out sample test. So for the period from July 2021 until November 2022. And uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now let's continue with uh, the out sample test. And it's uh, reasonable to expect a lower tracking quality. So a higher tracking error and a higher active return because it's pretty unlikely that the tracking portfolio at hand will be the best one in the future, even if it was the best one in the past. So as a general rule in investing, past performance is not the best indicator for the future, but a good tracking portfolio in the past is typically also a good one in the future because it has the same risk factors and similar weights compared to the index. And uh, we still have saved uh, the stocks of uh, the optimal tracking portfolio. And now we change the start and end to uh, the testing uh, periods. And then we can simply calculate the weights of the tracking portfolio and then uh, the returns of the tracking portfolio, the active returns, so the tracking error, and also the normalized prices of uh, the tracking portfolio in uh, the testing period. So let's check here the tracking error and let's recap that uh, in sample it was 3.0% uh, and now out sample the tracking error is 3.5%. Uh, so the out sample tracking error is higher but it's uh, still pretty good actually. And we have saved uh, the daily returns of uh, the tracking portfolio and tracking returns. And let's uh, give a name here to the Panda series. And let's concatenate uh, the daily returns of the tracking portfolio and uh, the daily returns of uh, the index and save it in test. So here we have for the daily returns and uh, we can simply pass here test to tracking to actually get uh, the tracking error and uh, the active return. So once again, the tracking error here out sample is 3.5% 
And uh, now we have a slightly positive active return of 0.8%. And now we can also visualize this. So with the normalized prices. So we start uh, with the one at uh, the beginning of uh, July and uh, we end at uh, 0.95 and 0.93. And let's simply plot this here. So in blue, we have for the tracking portfolio and in green, we have for the index. And uh, they closely move together also here in uh, the out sample period, in the testing period. So this is great. And uh, we can conclude uh, that typically we have a higher tracking error and also a higher, so either positive or negative active return in the out sample test. So we should definitely perform an out sample test. And uh, typically optimization leads uh, to a pretty good and uh, pretty low tracking errors. However, the active uh, return can deviate from zero and uh, to further reduce uh, the active return. So we could uh, combine optimization with the stratified sampling instead of random sampling. And of course, another way to uh, reduce uh, the active return is actually taking a larger sample size. So let's uh, recall that here we only have 110 out of 503 stocks. So this was passive investing and index tracking. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. Now let's start coding and we need pandas, numpy and also matplotlib. And now we load a little data set with eight stocks from the CSV file stocks.csv. So here we have uh, the daily close prices since uh, July 2017. So here we only have eight stocks, Apple, Boeing, Disney, General Electric, JP Morgan, Microsoft, Tesla and Walmart. And actually I only selected here eight stocks for demonstration purposes. So this makes it easier to explain and understand. But of course you can also create, analyze and optimize portfolios with uh, hundreds or even thousands of stocks. So this is just uh, for simplification and uh, demonstration purposes. And as we are creating portfolios uh, with uh, portfolio returns, also in this section, uh, we should work here with uh, simple returns. So these are the daily simple returns. And uh, then we can also calculate uh, the annualized the risk and the return for uh, the eight stocks uh, with uh, the function annualized the risk and return. So it assumes here simple returns and it calculates uh, the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. And uh, now let's pass here the returns starting from the second row. So this is just uh, for comparison purposes. So later we will lose uh, the very first row. And therefore also here we uh, calculate uh, the annualized risk and uh, the annualized return based on daily returns starting with uh, the second row. And here we have uh, the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. And uh, we will continue in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We still have saved uh, the daily returns. And uh, now let's uh, create some random portfolios and uh, random in a sense uh, that uh, the weights of the eight constituents are just uh, random. So neither price weighted nor equally weighted nor value weighted. And uh, with NumPy, it's really simple to create random numbers that can be turned or converted into random weights that uh, sum up to one. And uh, first of all, we have to define the number of assets. So in total, we have here eight constituents. And then for example, we could uh, simulate and create 10,000 uh, random portfolios. And uh, this means that uh, in total, we need to simulate uh, 80,000 uh, random weights and uh, first of all, we should set here a random seed to make it uh, reproducible for you. And then we can actually create 80,000 uh, random floats between zero and one. So that's uh, what np.random.random does. So creating a random floats in the interval between the zero and one. And then we can reshape the NumPy array with 80,000 elements into a matrix with uh, in total 10,000 rows and uh, eight columns. 
so here we have the matrix and uh, the shape is 10,000 rows and uh, eight columns. And uh, each row here is one portfolio with uh, eight weights. And uh, currently these weights uh, do not uh, sum up to one. So this is uh, pretty clear here. But now by dividing all elements in a row by uh, the sum of the row, we can actually turn the numbers the random numbers into weights so that sum up to one. So matrix divided by the sum per row actually makes the portfolio weights that sum up to one. So here's uh, the first portfolio and uh, the eight weights sum up to one. And uh, we can also double check this here. So now they sum up to one. And now let's further inspect uh, the very first the portfolio here. So at index position zero, so these are the weights of uh, the very first the portfolio. And now in this section, uh, we assume that uh, we set uh, the target weights of uh, the constituents at uh, the very first day, so only once, and uh, then we do not uh, rebalance uh, the portfolio, and uh, then the weights uh, move or deviate from the target weights or the initial weights. So that's uh, the plan. And actually to calculate uh, the portfolio returns and uh, the portfolio performance over time uh, with uh, no rebalancing, we have to calculate uh, the following. So we have to calculate uh, the weighted average investment multiple over time. So the weighted average over the eight constituents. So first of all, we uh, calculate uh, the invested multiple over time for each and uh, every instrument. So this can be done with add one and comp road. And then we actually calculate uh, the weighted average by multiplying with uh, the weights and then summing up per row. So let's have a look here. So this is uh, the investment multiple over time for the portfolio without uh, rebalancing. So it starts at uh, a base value of one on the 4th of July and then after five years, uh, we end up uh, with a multiple of uh, 3.53. And actually there's also a method uh, that aggregates here uh, the multiplication and uh, the sum. So to calculate uh, the weighted average, and it's actually the dot product. So we can simply calculate uh, the weighted average uh, with uh, the dot product passing here the weights. And uh, this gives uh, the very same normalized prices over time. And now we can also double check if and how the weights of uh, the constituents change over time. So we can get actually the initial weight after one day. So for example, for our Apple, we have 15.3%, for Boeing, 6.3% and so on. And then we can also get the final weights. And uh, Apple slightly increases from 15.3 to 16.4% and uh, Boeing decreases from 6% to 1%. And uh, this actually depends on the performance. And actually we can summarize here that we do not have active uh, rebalancing here and uh, the weights uh, deviate from the initial or the target weights as uh, the prices move. And uh, the rule is here pretty simple. So the weights of outperforming stocks increase over time. So for example here, Apple is slightly outperforming and therefore the weight increases over time and uh, the weight of underperforming stock uh, stocks decrease over time, as we can see here for Boeing. And actually this can also be seen as a momentum uh, trading strategy. So we increase uh, weights for successful stocks and we decrease weights for unsuccessful stocks and uh, this is called a momentum trading strategy. So even if uh, we are here in portfolio investing, we can't uh, fully separate this from trading. So this is portfolio investing uh, without uh, rebalancing. But uh, this also includes a momentum trading strategy as long as uh, we do not uh, rebalance the uh, portfolio. And finally, we can also measure the annualized risk and return of the first portfolio. So we have a pretty high compound annual growth rate, 29%, and also a pretty high risk. And finally, it's worth mentioning that a portfolio without the rebalancing is getting more and more concentrated. So before 
we had uh, these weights and uh, the most concentrated position was in Tesla 19% and as the Tesla showed a pretty good performance in the five years period then after five years we have a very concentrated position in Tesla so 58% so this was just one random portfolio and uh, we will analyze uh, the other 9999 random portfolios in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, let's continue with many portfolios and uh, we still have the weights for all 10,000 random portfolios here in the matrix uh, weights. And uh, then we can calculate normalized prices for all portfolios uh, with vectorized pandas code. So first we calculate normalized prices over time for these single stocks. And then we weight by the initial target weights with uh, the dot method. So that's pretty simple. And here we have normalized prices for 10,000 portfolios. So we have 10,000 columns and uh, 1257 days and for example the first portfolio so we start at a base value of one here on the fourth and then after five years we end up at 3.53 but uh, this is only one random portfolio out of 10,000 and uh, then we can calculate uh, these simple returns for all 10,000 random portfolios and uh, then we can pass uh, the portfolio returns uh, to annualize the risk and return and uh, we save the summary in portfolio summary so here we have now the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate for 10,000 random portfolios and uh, we still have saved here the summary for the constituents and uh, now we can plot actually the random portfolios together with uh, the constituents in a risk uh, return framework so let's simply have a look here so in red we can see here the cloud of random portfolios and in black we have uh, the constituents so tesla here walmart here boeing here and already here we can see that uh, by creating portfolios we can uh, create uh, risk return profiles that uh, we can't get with uh, single constituents so for example here less risk or more return and uh, we will go more into the details in the next lectures thanks for watching and see you there bye so we have 10,000 random portfolios here in our mean variance framework or risk return framework and now we need another metric that takes into account uh, risk and return so the higher the return the better and at the, the same time the lower the risk the better and uh, graphically this means uh, that uh, being here on the upper left corner is favorable so a high return and a low risk and being here on the, the lower right corner is not really good so high risk and low return and uh, the right metric here is uh, the risk adjusted return which is uh, the return so the compound annual growth rate divided by the risk so we can also say that uh, the compound annual growth rate per unit of risk and actually the goal is to maximize uh, the risk adjusted return and uh, the concept of uh, the risk adjusted return is similar to the sharp ratio so you might have heard of uh, the sharp ratio before but it's actually not identical and uh, we will cover the sharp ratio separately later in this course now let's add to the column risk adjusted return to the summary data frame by simply dividing the compound annual growth rate by the annualized risk so here on the right we have the risk adjusted return and uh, obviously Microsoft has uh, the highest uh, risk adjusted return and uh, there are some stocks uh, with some negative uh, risk adjusted returns. And then let's also add uh, the column risk adjusted return to uh, the uh, 10,000 random portfolios and uh, we can actually sort um, the random portfolios by the risk adjusted return and uh, for example the lowest the risk adjusted return has portfolio number 664 so minus 0 0.07 and uh, this portfolio here has uh, the highest uh, risk adjusted return so plus 1.08 and now for scaling purposes let's save here the lowest the uh, risk adjusted return and the highest so v min and uh, v max 
and uh, then we can actually add here a third dimension so we can assign a color to all portfolios and uh, the color actually means uh, the risk adjusted return so we add here a color bar and let's simply have a look here so here on the right uh, we have uh, the color bar from a very low risk adjusted return deep blue to high risk adjusted return deep red and here we can see so the more we are here on the upper left corner then the higher the risk adjusted return and actually the most favorable or attractive portfolios are here so in this area and just as a side note so i do have here a warning a matplotlib depreciation warning but we can ignore this warning as it seems to be a bug that is getting fixed in version 3.6 of the matplotlib library so now we can measure the risk adjusted return of our random portfolios and we can kind of sort or rank the portfolios by the risk adjusted return from high to low and uh, this allows us to actually find uh, the best or the optimal portfolio with uh, the highest uh, risk adjusted return and uh, portfolio optimization is uh, what uh, we will do in the next lectures thanks for watching and see you there bye in this lecture we will try to find the optimal portfolio that maximizes uh, the risk adjusted return and at this point it's important to note that uh, here we try to find uh, the best portfolio in the past so we are optimizing the past here, which is not 100% useful for finding the best the portfolio for the future. But uh, first we need to understand uh, the rationale and mechanics behind portfolio optimization. And uh, using past data makes it pretty easy and understandable. Now for portfolio optimization, we use uh, the SciPy optimizer here. So we import uh, scipy.optimize as SCO and uh, we also adjust the printing option slightly and uh, still we have saved here the simple returns for the eight constituents and now first of all we need uh, some uh, little helper functions so we have here the function portfolio returns where we have to pass uh, the weights of uh, the eight constituents and then portfolio return the function returns uh, the compound annual growth rate of uh, the portfolio so to sum up, uh, the user-defined function portfolio returns calculates uh, the portfolio compound annual growth rates based on uh, the weights. And then we have uh, the function portfolio volatility. And uh, this calculates uh, the annualized portfolio volatility also based on uh, the weights. And finally, we have to define a function uh, that calculates uh, the risk-adjusted return. So here we divide uh, the portfolio returns by the uh, portfolio volatility and uh, we have here a negative sign and uh, the reason for this is pretty simple so actually we want to maximize uh, the risk adjusted return but uh, the scipy optimizer can only minimize uh, functions and therefore this is a little trick so we calculate uh, negative uh, risk adjusted returns and therefore we try to minimize uh, the negative uh, risk adjusted returns so SciPy optimize only supports uh, minimization and not maximization and therefore we use here the little trick so the function returns here the risk adjusted return times minus one and then we can move on and uh, still we have eight assets and uh, we have to define a starting point of our optimization and uh, the simplest the starting point is actually equal weights and uh, we can create eight times uh, one divided by eight with np.full so here we have an array with uh, the equal weights so 12.5 percent eight times then next we have to define the constraint of our optimization and it's pretty obvious uh, that the uh, weights must sum up to one and uh, therefore so we have here the constraint it's an equation a lambda function and uh, the sum of the weights minus one must be zero so in other words uh, the sum of the weights must be one so this is just how we have to define it uh, for the scipy optimizer and finally we have to define a bounds so all weights shall be between zero and one 
and uh, this can be changed. So we create here uh, the tuple 0, 1 for all eight constituents. So we have eight times the tuple 0, 1. So the weights must be uh, between 0% and 100%. But of course, uh, we can change this. And uh, for example, we could say that uh, for Microsoft, we want to have uh, weights between 5 and 20% uh, or whatsoever. And uh, for this, we are ready to run uh, the SciPy minimizer. So we have SciPy optimize dot minimize. And uh, here we have to pass a function to be minimized. And the function is uh, the function uh, minimize function uh, risk adjusted return. Then we have to pass uh, the starting point, so the equal weights. Then we have to define a mathematical method. And uh, we select here SLSQP. And uh, SLSQP stands for sequential least squares uh, programming. So we have here a couple of methods uh, that uh, we can select from. And for our purposes here, we select uh, the SLSQP algorithm. So here we have some other algorithms. Finally, we have to define uh, some bounds. So we pass here bounds and some constraints. And uh, with this, we can uh, run the minimizer and save the results in the variable opts. And actually we get here a type error. So let's have a look here above. So I think uh, we haven't run all cells and this is true here. So we have to define the two functions here and now we can run again. And now it works and now we can actually check the output of our optimization. And uh, first of all, we can find uh, the minimized value. So it's minus 1.14. And this means that the best portfolio has a risk adjusted return of plus 1.14. And then under X, we can actually find uh, the weights. So let's extract here the weights, optimal weights. And it's best uh, to just create here a panda series together with uh, the symbols. So now it's getting clear that uh, the optimal portfolio contains 53% Microsoft, 26% Apple and 20% uh, Tesla. And uh, we have zero weight uh, for the other five stocks. And uh, this leads to the conclusion that optimization, at least without bounds, does not necessarily lead to practical or factual diversification. So the diversification of uh, the best portfolio is rather low. So we have concentrated positions in Microsoft, Apple, and Tesla. And now we can calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate of uh, the optimal portfolio. So we can simply pass optimal weights to uh, portfolio return. So it's 37.9% uh, and also the volatility 33% and uh, the risk adjusted return 1.14 and now it's just best uh, to visualize uh, this one more time. So we have now here in uh, purple, that's uh, the optimal portfolio that maximizes uh, the risk adjusted return. And obviously we were pretty close uh, with uh, some of our random portfolios, but of course uh, we didn't uh, meet the best, uh, the absolute best portfolio here. And uh, once again, so this is uh, the portfolio that maximizes uh, the risk adjusted return. And let us remind one more time that uh, we have optimized here the past. So it's a backward looking optimization. And it is very unlikely that we had selected uh, this optimal portfolio back in the year. I think that's not correct, 2017. And uh, this is also called uh, the look ahead bias. So if we assume that uh, we can make decisions based on future data, so back in 2017, we simply didn't have here the data our analysis is based on. So this uh, would be the look ahead bias here. And also it's very unlikely that uh, this portfolio here will be the optimal portfolio in the future because, and this is one of the most important rules in uh, trading and investing, so past performance is not a good indicator for the future performance. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture.
Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have found uh, the maximum risk adjusted uh, return portfolio. And now let's uh, find another interesting portfolio, the minimum variance portfolio. And as uh, the name says, uh, the minimum variance portfolio minimizes uh, the risk. So the plan is now to find uh, the portfolio with uh, the lowest risk and to find uh, the minimum variance portfolio. We can simply adjust here the uh, minimizer. And here within uh, scipy optimize.minimize, we can replace uh, the function to be minimized. So instead of minimizing the negative risk adjusted return, we simply have to minimize uh, the portfolio volatility and then everything else remains unchanged here. So let's uh, run again here the optimizer and let's save uh, the results in uh, opts. And now let's go here above and let's continue here with opts and let's get uh, the optimal weights so the weights for the minimum variance portfolio and uh, here we have a concentrated position in walmart so 46 percent followed by disney 17 percent ge 17 percent jp morgan and uh, we have zero weights for tesla and boeing so this is a completely different portfolio and uh, then we can also calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate and uh, the volatility and also the risk adjusted return. And finally, we can once again visualize here the minimum variance portfolio. So in purple, and this time we have here the minimum variance portfolio. And one more time, it's getting clear here that uh, with creating portfolios, we can actually uh, reduce uh, the overall risk and uh, we can get a risk level that uh, we can't reach uh, with any of uh, the single constituents here. So Walmart is uh, the least uh, risky stock, but still the minimum variance portfolio has uh, considerably less risk than Walmart. So this was uh, the minimum variance portfolio. And in the next lecture, we will continue with uh, the maximum return portfolio. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Finally, let's find uh, the maximum return portfolio. And intuitively, uh, the maximum return portfolio should consist of only one stock. So 100% of uh, the stock with uh, the highest return. And in our case, uh, this is here Tesla. So we would expect uh, the maximum return portfolio exactly here, 100% of Tesla. But now let's double check this and uh, we have to slightly redefine here the function portfolio return because uh, this time uh, this is uh, the function to be minimized and therefore we have to make uh, the compound annual growth rate negative. So we have to minimize uh, the negative uh, compound annual growth rate and uh, then we can run the optimizer here again. And let's go up and let's run here the other code. So here we have opts and then we can check for the optimal weights and it's no surprise that here we have 100% Tesla. And one more time we can calculate the return here. So 59% and uh, the volatility and uh, the risk adjusted return. And let's create here the plot one more time. And now we can see here that uh, the maximum return portfolio is identical to 100% Tesla. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In the last couple of lectures, we have identified uh, three special portfolios. The optimal portfolio then maximizes uh, the risk adjusted return, then uh, the minimum variance portfolio. And finally, the maximum return portfolio, which is not uh, really a portfolio. And all uh, three portfolios have one thing in common. So they are all located on uh, the so-called efficient frontier. And uh, the efficient frontier is uh, the line, or better, it's uh, the curve where we can find portfolios uh, with different return levels. But uh, each portfolio is uh, the one with uh, the lowest volatility given its uh, return level. So this sounds complicated, but uh, let's just uh, see this live in action.
And uh, we still have saved here the simple returns of the constituents. And once again, let's define here the helper functions portfolio return that returns uh, the compound annual growth rate and uh, the portfolio volatility that returns uh, the annualized risk. And one more time, so we have here eight assets and uh, we start with uh, the equal weights and uh, we still have saved here the summary data frame where we have the risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate for our eight constituents. And now the return level of any portfolio can range from uh, the lowest return here, so from minus 20% to the highest return, so plus uh, 60%. And uh, the plan is now to create, uh, for example, 100 evenly spaced target returns between the minimum and uh, the maximum. And uh, we can do this uh, with np.lin space. And uh, we save here these uh, target returns in the variable target compound annual growth rate. So from minus 21% to 59% evenly spaced. So we have here 100 target returns. And uh, the plan is now to actually find for each and every return level here, the portfolio with uh, the minimum variance. So we want to minimize uh, the portfolio volatility for each return level. And this means uh, we have here 100 optimizations. And uh, now let's move on here. And uh, now we have here an additional constraint. So the sum of weights not only must the sum up to one, so the sum minus one equals zero, but uh, as a second constraint, so the portfolio return must equal the target uh, return, or in other words, so the portfolio return minus so the target return must be zero. So this is how it's defined here with uh, the SciPy optimizer. And still the bounds are between uh, zero and one for each and every constituent. And now let's create an empty list volatilities. And here we save for the 100 volatilities. So the lowest volatilities for any given return level. And now in the next step, let's iterate over the target returns. So we iterate here over the array with 100 elements. And for each and every target return, we actually minimize the volatility and we save the result in the result. And then we access uh, the minimum volatility in each optimization and we append the minimum volatility to the list of volatilities. And the finally, we convert the list into a NumPy array. So the final output is a NumPy array with uh, the minimum volatilities for uh, the target returns. So let's uh, run here the for loop and uh, this could take a couple of seconds. And now let's inspect uh, the NumPy array volatilities. So for example, for the target return minus uh, 21%, the lowest volatility is 43% and so on. And uh, now we can actually visualize here the efficient frontier. So here in blue, we have uh, the efficient frontier from GE to Tesla. And actually to be more precise, the efficient frontier is only here starting at uh, the minimum variance portfolio to uh, the maximum return portfolio. So this is here the efficient frontier. And it is called the efficient frontier because only portfolios located here on the efficient frontier are efficient and all other portfolios are inefficient in a sense that we can always find another portfolio with uh, the same risk and higher return or the same return and lower risk. So let's, for example, take uh, this uh, portfolio here and uh, then we can always find a portfolio with uh, the same risk but higher return or the same return and lower risk. So these portfolios here that are not on the efficient frontier are completely dominated by the portfolios on the efficient frontier. And uh, with this, we have reached uh, the end of uh, this section. 
Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Bye. So far we have analyzed equity portfolios uh, without rebalancing and uh, this means uh, we had initial target weights and then the weights uh, moved or slipped away from target weights over time. So as uh, prices change. Now portfolio rebalancing is an essential part in portfolio investing and portfolio management and uh, therefore let's perform the very same analysis and optimization as before but now with daily rebalancing and I'm now here in notebook 5 equity uh, portfolios with daily rebalancing and essentially here we have uh, the very same code as in notebook 4 with uh, very few modifications and uh, changes have to be made whenever we calculate portfolio returns. So let's go through the notebook here and let's identify the code that has to be changed. So here we calculate or create random portfolios and then here we actually calculate uh, the portfolio return. And instead of waiting the normalized prices over time, which leads uh, to uh, portfolio returns without uh, rebalancing, now we calculate uh, the weighted average simple returns and uh, assuming daily rebalancing here. So we have returns and then uh, we multiply with the weights and sum up. And uh, also here we can aggregate uh, these two steps into one step uh, with uh, the dot product. And with uh, this code we implicitly assume active rebalancing so the weights are getting restored to initial or target weights at uh, the end of each day. So it assumes that at uh, the end of each day we rebalance. And uh, this means uh, selling daily winners to actually uh, again uh, reduce uh, their weights and buying da daily losers to increase uh, the weights back to the initial target weights. And uh, this is also defined as a contrarian trading strategy. So once again, we can't uh, fully separate uh, portfolio investing and uh, trading and uh, daily rebalancing or rebalancing in general contains actually a contrarian trading strategy. So we uh, sell winners and uh, we buy losers. And now let me just uh, run here the code and uh, then let's inspect uh, one more time. So I've run the code here and uh, here we have uh, the optimal portfolio that maximizes uh, the risk adjusted return. And I can tell you that uh, here the return of uh, this portfolio with the rebalancing is slightly higher. And also we can check here the efficient front here. And at a first glance it looks similar to the other one and therefore it's just best uh, to really compare the efficient front here with uh, rebalancing and uh, without uh, rebalancing and that's uh, the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now let's compare the efficient front here with and without rebalancing and uh, for simplicity reasons I just copied and uh, pasted uh, the underlying data for the efficient frontier without uh, rebalancing here into uh, this notebook. So here we have uh, the return levels and then the corresponding minimum volatilities. And then we can visualize uh, the efficient frontier with uh, rebalancing and uh, without uh, rebalancing. So let's simply have a look here. And uh, we have in blue the efficient frontier with the daily rebalancing and in green without uh, rebalancing. And uh, we can clearly observe here an upward shift of uh, the efficient frontier with the uh, rebalancing and an upward shift is always positive because it allows us uh, to get more return for an equal amount of risk or less risk uh, with uh, the same return level. So that's uh, the effect of uh, rebalancing here in uh, this example. But generally we can say that uh, rebalancing always leads uh, to a higher degree of diversification because uh, we restore weights to diversified weights. So we maintain a higher degree of diversification and uh, this is always positive. And second, active uh, rebalancing automatically includes a contrarian uh, trading so we sell winners and uh, buy losers and in our example here 
this uh, creates uh, higher profits and it increases uh, the compound annual growth rate. But uh, generally, contrarian trading can be positive or negative. So we might find other examples where we observe a downward shift of uh, the efficient frontier, but uh, the more typical case is an upward shift. Now, there's one important thing that uh, we have ignored so far. So daily rebalancing requires trading and uh, trading typically triggers trading costs and uh, we should not ignore the impact of trading costs. So to really and fairly compare rebalancing and no rebalancing, we have to take into account trading costs and uh, trading costs will always penalize the active rebalancing. So we can assume that uh, with uh, trading costs, the upward shift of uh, the efficient frontier is uh, less significant or lower than without the trading costs. And uh, maybe the efficient frontier with the trading costs is even below the green one. So we don't know and we have to analyze. And uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Hi and welcome to this section on portfolio theory and uh, the pitfalls of portfolio optimization. And uh, so far we just optimized uh, the past, but now let's move on with forward looking optimization. And first we need some more theoretical background and also some math uh, to better understand uh, the effect of portfolio diversification and also the driving forces behind portfolio diversification. And uh, I will also provide some more math tools uh, that allow us to simplify the optimization. So we will use uh, linear algebra. And then the ultimate goal is uh, forward looking mean variance optimization. And uh, that's probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in investing in finance, where a lot of uh, things can go wrong because uh, there are a couple of challenges and pitfalls. And I want to highlight uh, these problems here in this section. And last but not least, I will also introduce uh, a so-called risk-free asset. So for example, a government bond. And uh, the introduction of a risk-free asset slightly changes our analysis and uh, the optimization. So this is a pretty important section here. Thanks for watching and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next lectures. Bye. In this section, we will work with a nice little data set for demonstration purposes. So you can find uh, the data set stocks.csv in the download folder. But first of all, let's import pandas, numpy and also matplotlib. And then let's load uh, the data set into a pandas data frame df. And uh, here we have in total eight stocks. So we have Apple, Boeing, Disney, uh, General Electric, JP Morgan, Microsoft, Tesla, and also Walmart. And uh, here we can find uh, the prices. So for uh, the five year period from July, 2017 until the end of June, 2022. So this is uh, the price data, but as always uh, return data is typically more useful and more meaningful. And therefore we create here the data frame returns uh, with uh, these simple returns. And then we can also simply measure the performance. So the historical performance of uh, these stocks in terms of uh, risk and return with uh, the function annualized the risk and return. And uh, this assumes here that we pass a data frame with simple returns. And then we calculate here the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. And uh, we assume here 252 trading days per year, which is uh, quite uh, realistic and a quite a good approximation for US stocks. So let's save here the user defined function. And now let's create uh, the summary data frame. So here we have the annualized risk and uh, the return. So the compound annual growth rate for uh, the eight stocks. And actually, as always, it's just best uh, to visualize uh, the risk return profile for all eight stocks here. So let's simply create here a plot with uh, the annualized risk here on the x-axis and uh, the return on the y-axis. 
And uh, here we can see Tesla, so the highest risk, but also the highest return. And on the other hand side, uh, we can see Walmart uh, with a very low risk, but also a moderate return. And also here the general relationship holds. So more return goes hand in hand uh, with higher risk. And uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this and the next few lectures, uh, we start uh, with a very simple example. And uh, the most simple case is a portfolio consisting of uh, two assets only, so the two asset case. And uh, still we have here the summary data frame with uh, eight assets. And uh, for example, we could select uh, Walmart and Apple, so two assets. And then we could also rename here the column headers uh, just to risk and uh, return. And then we can visualize uh, the risk and return profile for the two assets. And uh, this is actually uh, the classic situation. So we have uh, one asset uh, with uh, moderate risk, but also low return, Walmart. And uh, one asset uh, with higher return, but also higher risk like Apple here. And uh, from a portfolio perspective, so this is uh, the risk return profile of a portfolio consisting of 100% Walmart and 0% uh, Apple. And uh, this is uh, the portfolio consisting of 100% Apple and 0% uh, Walmart. And uh, the question is now, so what's uh, the return profile for portfolios that consists of Apple and Walmart? So for example, 50-50. 70% Apple and 30% uh, Walmart. And uh, that's uh, what we are going to analyze in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this and the next lectures, uh, we are going to calculate the return and the risk of portfolios consisting of uh, the two assets, Walmart and Apple. So from 100% Walmart to 100% Apple. And uh, intuitively, uh, the portfolios should uh, actually form here a straight line or they should lie on a straight line between Walmart and Apple. And a straight line would mean that uh, the portfolio return is uh, the weighted average return of the constituents and uh, the portfolio risk is uh, the weighted average uh, risk of the constituents. So that's uh, the most intuitive solution and our working hypothesis. And uh, we will see whether this is correct or not. Now, first of all, let's create 100 portfolios that are between uh, the two extreme ones here. So we create 100 uh, weights for asset A. So that's Walmart in this case. So from 0% to 100%. And likewise, we can determine the weights of asset B. So in our case, Apple, and uh, we simply have to deduct uh, weights of asset A from one, so one minus uh, the weights of asset A. And then we can organize uh, both arrays here in one two-dimensional array weights. So here we have the first portfolio consisting of 0% Walmart and 100% Apple. And then the second one is 1% Walmart and 99% Apple and so on. So these are 100 portfolios and uh, let's take uh, one portfolio here. So for example, at index position one, so that's uh, the second portfolio. And here we have 1% Walmart and 99% Apple. And still we have here our subset. So we have the risk and uh, the return for Walmart and Apple. And now having the portfolio weights and uh, the returns of the constituents, we can actually calculate uh, the portfolio returns. And uh, to calculate uh, the portfolio returns, it's actually correct uh, to calculate uh, the weighted average return. So this is here the correct formula. So the portfolio return is equal to the weight of asset A times uh, the return of asset A plus uh, the weight of asset B times uh, the return of asset B. So that's uh, the right formula. And uh, we have two different ways how we can calculate it. So we can either simply uh, take here the formula. So taking here the weight of Walmart times uh, the return of Walmart plus uh, the weight of Apple times uh, the return of Apple. 
gives uh, the return of portfolio to 30.55%. So this is uh, the first option, but coding wise, uh, there's an even uh, simpler way how to do it. So we can use vectorized coding and uh, we can simply calculate here the dot product between the uh, returns and uh, the weights. So the dot product uh, between uh, the Panda series returns and the weights. So this is also referred to matrix or vector multiplication. And no surprise, so we get here the very same result. So 30.55%. So this is uh, the return of one portfolio, portfolio two, but uh, we actually have here a matrix uh, with 100 portfolios and 100 uh, weights actually. And uh, we can simply use here vectorized coding to calculate uh, the return for many portfolios. And also here we use uh, the dot product. So we have subset uh, return dot and then uh, the transpose the ma weights matrix. And by doing so, we get here a NumPy array with uh, all 100 returns for the 100 portfolios. So starting with 30% uh, for the portfolio that only consists of uh, Apple. And finally, if we only have Walmart, then we have 10%. So this was uh, the return. So we can simply calculate uh, the portfolio return by taking the weighted average returns. And in the next lecture, we will continue with uh, the portfolio risk. Bye. Now, finally, let's come back uh, to portfolio risk and how to calculate uh, the risk of portfolios. And uh, we still have saved uh, the weights of uh, the 100 uh, portfolios. And also we have just uh, portfolio two, so the weights for portfolio two, and uh, we still have saved here the subset, so risk and return for Walmart and uh, for Apple. And assuming perfect positive correlation between Walmart and Apple, we can actually calculate uh, the portfolio risk with uh, the following uh, code here. So this is just uh, the weighted average risk, so 31.9%. However, we have learned that uh, the correlation between assets is an important input and is actually part of uh, the following uh, formula here. And only if the correlation is one, then we can use um, uh, this code here. And otherwise, uh, the calculation of the portfolio risk uh, seems to be a bit more complex. So we also have here the covariance matrix. So on a daily basis, and we can also annualize uh, the covariance matrix by multiplying it uh, with uh, 252. And also we have uh, the correlation matrix. And now having all the inputs uh, for the formula here, we can uh, simply apply the formula. So that's uh, this coding line here. And uh, this is uh, rather messy. But uh, we could do this and uh, here we get 31.8%. Uh, so we can see here a diversification effect. So a reduction from 31.9 to 31.8. So just coding uh, this formula here is nice, but uh, there's a much better way how we can do it. And uh, we can actually do it uh, with the linear algebra and uh, this is actually clearly beyond uh, the scope of this course. And if you want to know more about linear algebra and matrix multiplication, uh, you can click here on uh, the Wikipedia link. And uh, the key message is here that it's uh, much easier coding wise with uh, linear algebra to calculate actually the portfolio risk. So either the variance or uh, the standard deviation and uh, the portfolio variance is simply the vector, so the weights vector transposed times uh, the covariance matrix times uh, the weights. So this is matrix multiplication here. And uh, the result of this uh, two matrix multiplications will be uh, the portfolio variance. And then we can simply take uh, the square root to calculate uh, the portfolio standard deviation. So that's uh, the formula. And coding wise, uh, this is pretty simple. So we can take uh, the weights vector and then use uh, the dot product with uh, the covariance matrix. 
And then we use another matrix multiplication between uh, the result here and uh, the weights uh, vector one more time. And then we take uh, the square root. And uh, this also gives uh, the portfolio a standard deviation of 31.83%. And finally, we can calculate uh, the portfolio risk also for many portfolios. So here we have a weights matrix that is two-dimensional, not one-dimensional. And uh, then uh, the formula or the code looks uh, slightly different. But here we can actually calculate uh, the standard deviation for all 100 portfolios. And for example, here for the second portfolio, the risk is of course uh, the very same. So this is uh, the linear algebra formula and uh, the corresponding code to actually and uh, simply calculate uh, portfolio risk. And uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We can now correctly calculate uh, the portfolio risk. And now in a last step, let's analyze uh, the risk diversification effect in our two asset case. And uh, we still have saved here the correlation matrix and uh, the correlation coefficient between uh, Walmart and Apple is uh, 0 0.35. So this means a moderate positive correlation and uh, there must be a portfolio diversification effect. So the uh, correlation is clearly below one and uh, there shouldn't be a straight line in uh, the plot. And uh, we still have saved here the portfolio returns. So these are simply the weighted average returns for 100 portfolios. And now with linear algebra, we can calculate uh, the corresponding portfolio risks. And now we are ready to actually visualize all 100 portfolios and also the constituents. And uh, here we can clearly see that uh, we do not have a straight line. So it's a curve. And uh, this is indeed uh, the portfolio diversification effect. So compared to the straight line, each point here is located more to the upper left corner. Now we have visualized uh, the portfolio effect uh, for the correlation coefficient one. So there's uh, no effect and uh, 0 0.3435. And now let's assume various values for the correlation coefficient and let's compare the diversification effect. So we change uh, the correlation coefficient to everything else equal. And uh, for example, we could work with uh, the coefficients minus one minus 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5 and 1. And here we have uh, the corresponding colors for the graph. And uh, still we have saved uh, the weights matrix uh, with uh, the 100 portfolios. And also here the summary and uh, the covariance matrix and also the portfolio returns. And now we actually iterate over the uh, correlations. So that's uh, the correlations. And uh, then for each and every correlation, uh, we actually update uh, the covariance. So calculate uh, the covariance given the new assumption for the correlation and uh, using here also the variances for the constituents. And then we overwrite here the covariance matrix and then we calculate uh, the portfolio risk and uh, we already have uh, the portfolio return. So let's simply run here the cell. And once again here we have Walmart and Apple and uh, in red we can actually see uh, the portfolios assuming a correlation coefficient of one. Then in blue we have 0 0.5. Then in gray we have no correlation. And in uh, yellow 0 point, minus 0 0.5. And finally here in green, a perfect negative correlation, minus uh, one. And uh, we can see here that uh, we reach a portfolio where the risk is uh, zero. And uh, this is also called a perfect hedge. So whenever we combine uh, two risky assets and uh, we receive a portfolio with uh, zero risk, then this is a perfect hedge. 
and uh, in the real world uh, this is very uncommon and typically uh, we can see uh, perfect hedges in uh, structured products and also in derivatives and uh, just as a side note so the return of a perfect hedge is uh, typically very low so comparable to a governance bond and otherwise uh, there would exist the profitable arbitrage opportunities so correlation coefficients like minus one and one are the extreme cases but typically for stocks uh, so the correlation should be somewhere here and therefore finally we can conclude that uh, the portfolio diversification effect is as follows so we can get more return for the same risk or less risk for the very same return and uh, market participants also say that uh, portfolio diversification is uh, the only free lunch in the market so typically higher returns go hand in hand with higher risk and it's uh, really hard to increase returns and reduce risk at the very same time in the markets and at least it's not for free so you need high skills or superior information or whatsoever but in any case uh, you can be sure that uh, the portfolio diversification effect is for free so that's a free lunch and uh, you just have to take it and that's maybe the key message here of uh, the entire section thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture bye now let's move on with the multi-asset case and uh, the key message is that coding wise we do not have to change uh, anything here so the linear algebra formulas and uh, the corresponding code works in any case no matter if we have two or 200 assets in our portfolio and uh, we start here from scratch and import pandas numpy and matplotlib and then we import uh, stocks.csv with uh, the eight stocks and then uh, let's uh, first of all consider the three asset case uh, with walmart apple and uh, ba so let's create here a subset and then we can uh, calculate uh, the returns and get uh, a summarized data frame with annualized uh, risk and return. And then we can also calculate uh, the annualized covariance matrix. And uh, the plan is now to actually calculate uh, 1 million uh, random portfolios uh, with random weights. So we have uh, three assets and 1 million portfolios and then we can create uh, the matrix uh, with uh, the weights. So this is just repetition here. So here we have uh, 1 million portfolios uh, with uh, the weights that of course sum up to one. And now let's focus on one portfolio. So the very first one here where we have 57% uh, uh, Walmart and 23% uh, Apple and so on so these are the weights and then given the weights and uh, the returns we can actually calculate the portfolio returns so this is simply the weighted average and uh, the code is uh, the very same as before so this portfolio returns 11.7 percent and now let's move on with portfolio risk so this is uh, the three asset case where we have a b and c and also the pairwise uh, correlations so a and b a and c and uh, b and c and uh, of course we can use here the very same code so we have two matrix multiplications between uh, the weights vector and the covariance matrix and then again with uh, the weights vector leading to a risk of 22.2 percent and now we can also calculate the risk and return for all random portfolios and now we can simply visualize uh, the result here and in red we can actually see the full set of uh, possible portfolios however the uh, efficient portfolios are located here on uh, the efficient frontier so the efficient frontier starts here and it's just here the curve between the minimum variance portfolio and apple so this was uh, the three asset case and uh, for the sake of completeness let's consider also the eight asset case so now let's uh, rerun here and let's select 
all assets here. So let's simply rerun the code and let's check the graph. So here's uh, the co corresponding graph. And once again, uh, the set of uh, possible portfolios spans here from here to here and to Tesla. However, the efficient frontier, so the efficient set of uh, efficient portfolios is just here. And now in the very next step, uh, we will consider one more time portfolio optimization. So that's uh, the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We are coming now explicitly to forward looking optimization. So what's uh, the optimal way uh, to have an optimal portfolio also in the future? And uh, future looking mean variance optimization is not uh, that simple. And it's one of the most misunderstood and misused concepts in finance and investing because uh, there are a couple of challenges and also pitfalls. And first and most important, we need to forecast inputs like uh, the covariance matrix and uh, the returns. And uh, as a very simple solution, uh, we could just use uh, the past covariance matrix and also past returns. However, the problem here is that uh, typically uh, past performance is not a good indicator for future performance. And uh, this at least holds true for the returns. However, the past uh, covariance matrix uh, can be a good approximation for the future. And therefore, typically uh, using uh, the past the covariance matrix or variance of it, like for example, with uh, shrinkage is widely accepted. And in contrast to that, uh, using past returns is not accepted. And uh, we will also see this in this and the next lectures. So for the time being, uh, we will work with past returns, but uh, we should keep in mind that uh, there are better ways to actually predict uh, future returns. And finally, coming to the optimization tools. So, so far we have worked uh, with uh, the SciPy optimizer that uses a numerical or iterative optimization, but uh, we can also use uh, linear algebra. So this is formula based. So we can have a formula that uh, solves for the optimal weights. And uh, in particular, we can perform unbounded optimization with linear algebra. And that's exactly what uh, we will do here in this lecture. So let's import pandas, numpy, and also matplotlib. And uh, one more time, let's get uh, the stocks uh, CSV data set. And then for example, we can select uh, three assets, Walmart, Apple, and uh, Microsoft, and calculate uh, the returns and uh, the annualized performance. And then we can also calculate uh, the covariance matrix, so the annualized covariance matrix. And then we can actually solve uh, for the efficient weights uh, with linear algebra. So the efficient weights, that's a vector, is equal to the inverse covariance matrix. So minus one v means inverse matrix. And uh, we will see in a minute what an inverse matrix is times uh, the expected uh, returns uh, vector. So also this is uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, this gives a vector with uh, the uh, non-normalized efficient weights. And uh, then finally, we have to normalize uh, the weights so that uh, they sum up to one. So that's uh, the plan for now. And first of all, we need uh, the inverse uh, covariance matrix. And uh, based on uh, the covariance matrix, uh, we can actually calculate the inverse weight matrix uh, with uh, the following code. And I don't want to go into the details here. So that's beyond the scope. We just uh, create and calculate here the inverse matrix. And uh, just to give you an idea what uh, the inverse matrix is. So if you perform a matrix multiplication between the matrix and its inverse matrix, then we get a so-called identity matrix. And uh, the identity matrix is a matrix where we have the value one in the diagonal and uh, otherwise we have zeros here. So this is here the inverse covariance matrix and now we are ready to actually get uh, the efficient weights. So we simply have to multiply the inverse matrix uh, with uh, the expected returns. 
And that's exactly here, the code and the formula. And uh, by doing so, we get uh, the non-normalized weights that do not sum up to one. And then we can simply normalize uh, the weights. And uh, then we are left uh, with uh, the weights uh, that sum up to one. So in the optimal portfolio, we have 65% Microsoft, 33% Apple, and only 0.5% Walmart. So this is how we can get uh, the optimal portfolio with linear algebra. And in the next lecture, we will continue with uh, the pitfalls of uh, forward looking portfolio optimization. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the financial markets, we can differentiate between risky assets and risk free assets. And uh, the vast majority of assets are risky assets. So stocks, corporate bonds, commodities, uh, cryptocurrencies and more are all risky assets and uh, risky in a sense that uh, the outcome is uncertain. So this means that we simply don't know if we make, uh, for example, plus 10% or minus 10% return in the next year because the companies can go bankrupt and uh, the demand for commodities like oil or for cryptocurrencies can collapse from one day to another. So risky assets are volatile in a sense that the prices can change and move up and down all the time. And in contrast to that, the outcome of a risk-free asset is known in advance. And the best example of a risk-free asset are government bonds are treasury rates of highly stable countries like the US or Germany. And uh, just in case you don't know, so with a government bond, investors lend uh, money to the government for a fixed time. So for example, one year and typically for a fixed interest rate or coupon rate, like for example, 3%. And it's close to 100% certain that in one year, the investors uh, get back their money plus uh, the interest. So the outcome is known and uh, there's close to 0% uh, default risk because it's very, very unlikely that countries like uh, US or Germany can't uh, pay back their debt. And uh, given the nature of government bonds, so the price volatility for listed government bonds is close to zero, so at least for short-term bonds. And uh, let's have a look here at Bloomberg. So here we can see uh, government bonds for the US, UK, Germany, Japan, and Australia. So here we have US and we have different uh, maturities. So from three months to 30 years. And here we can see uh, the coupon and uh, the yield. So currently it's uh, around about 3%. And uh, this all leads to the following characteristics. So we know the return before. So in advance, for example, 3%. That's uh, the return of uh, the risk-free asset. And then by definition, the risk or the volatility is uh, very close to zero. And uh, this also leads uh, to the conclusion that uh, there is a close to zero correlation between the risk-free asset and uh, risky assets. Now, taking into account uh, the risk-free asset, there's an even better metric for the risk-adjusted return so, so far we worked uh, with uh, the following definition of uh, the risk adjusted return. So we had uh, the return of the asset or the portfolio divided by the risk. And now we add here the risk free return RF and uh, the return of the portfolio or the asset minus RF is also referred to, to the risk premium. So when investing in uh, risky assets, investors demand a risk premium. So the return of a risky asset must be higher than the return of uh, the risk-free asset because uh, there is some risk. And uh, the risk premium is uh, the reward of taking risk here. And uh, together, so this is uh, the sharp ratio. And uh, this seems to be an arbitrary definition but in this and the next lectures, I will show and explain the logic behind the sharp ratio. But now let's start coding. So we need pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. And again, we import stocks.csv. And uh, in this example, we work with uh, all eight stocks. Then we can create uh, the simple returns and the summary. So the annualized risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. 
And now with uh, the formula here, we can actually calculate the sharp ratio. So it's simply the return minus uh, the risk-free rate divided by the risk. And of course, first of all, we have to define RF. So we haven't run the two cells here. So now we can calculate the sharp ratio here on the right. And uh, Microsoft has uh, the highest sharp ratio with 0.93. And then we can also calculate uh, the covariance matrix, uh, the annualized covariance matrix. And now again, let's create uh, 1 million random portfolios. So this isn't anything new. So we create random weights and uh, the corresponding portfolio return and the risk and then also the sharp ratio. And uh, so the minimum sharp ratio of uh, the poorest portfolio is minus 0.42 and uh, the maximum sharp ratio is 1.0. And uh, we can also add uh, the risk-free asset to the summary data frame. So by definition, uh, the risk is zero and uh, the return is 3%. And uh, we can't define uh, the sharp ratio here. And finally, let's plot uh, the stocks and uh, the 1 million portfolios. And uh, we added here a color map uh, for the random portfolios. So this is, so to say, a three-dimensional plot where the color actually marks uh, the sharp ratio from dark red, which is uh, the highest sharp ratio, one to dark blue, the lowest sharp ratio. And here we can see the interesting part with high sharp ratios. And last but not least here on the very left-hand side, we can see the risk-free asset so we have zero risk and 3% uh, return. So it's here on the left hand side. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, I said that the sharp ratio seems to be a somehow arbitrary metric for the risk adjusted return. But uh, there is a deeper logic or meaning behind uh, the sharp ratio. And it's just best uh, to have a look at uh, the mean uh, variance chart here. And as an example, let's interpret the uh, sharp ratio for Microsoft. So here we have Microsoft. And again, here we have uh, the risk-free asset. And uh, if uh, we draw a straight line uh, from the risk-free asset to uh, Microsoft, then uh, the sharp ratio of Microsoft is simply the slope of uh, the line here. And uh, let me explain why. So if you recall from high school math, then the slope of a straight line is uh, actually delta y divided by delta x. And let's have a look at delta y first. So here we have delta y, which is equal to uh, the return of Microsoft minus uh, the risk-free rate. So that's delta y and delta x is simply the risk of Microsoft. And uh, this leads here to the following conclusion. So the slope of the line is equal to uh, delta y divided by delta x, which is uh, the risk premium divided by the standard deviation of uh, Microsoft and uh, this is exactly the definition of the sharp ratio. So if we draw a straight line from RF to a portfolio, then uh, the portfolio's uh, sharp ratio can be interpreted as uh, the slope of the line. And uh, we will see in the next lecture why this is an important property. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have learned that uh, the sharp ratio of an asset or portfolio can be interpreted as uh, the slope of uh, the straight line connecting uh, the risk-free rate and uh, the asset or the portfolio. And now let's move on with portfolio optimization with uh, the risk-free asset. And uh, so far we maximized uh, the risk-adjusted return. And now with uh, the risk-free asset, the plan is to find the portfolio with uh, the highest sharp ratio. 
And uh, from a graphical point of view, finding the maximum sharp ratio portfolio is uh, pretty interesting because to find uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio, we simply have to find uh, the straight line from RF that uh, touches here the efficient frontier or in other words, we need to find uh, the tangency line from RF to the efficient frontier. And uh, the tangency line is uh, the line with uh, the highest slope that at least uh, touches here one portfolio. And uh, the tangency portfolio is uh, the portfolio with uh, the highest sharp ratio. So this sounds a bit complicated, but now let's uh, do this uh, with uh, Python code. So we need uh, scipy.optimize and still we have a summary and we drop RF here. And then we define the helper functions, the portfolio return and the portfolio volatility. And then instead of having the function minimize the risk adjusted return, we have now the function sharp. So the sharp is uh, the portfolio return minus RF divided by the portfolio volatility. And once again, we have here the minus sign because uh, with the scipy.optimize, we can only minimize. And then let's define the number of assets, eight, and let's create the equal weights as a starting point. And now in a first step, let's uh, create uh, the efficient frontier. So we have two constraints here. And then let's create 500 target uh, returns and uh, then the bounds are between a zero and one. And once again, for each target return, let's find uh, the portfolio with uh, the lowest volatility. So that's uh, the definition of uh, the efficient frontier. And then we can also visualize this. So here we have uh, the efficient frontier. And in the next lecture, we will find uh, the tangency line. So from RF to the efficient frontier here. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have created uh, the efficient frontier. And now let's find uh, the optimal portfolio. So the max sharp ratio portfolio with uh, scipy.optimize. And uh, we can actually build on uh, the last lecture and uh, we only have to change here the constraint. So we only have uh, one constraint. So the weights must sum up to one. And then we can run the minimization algorithm. And uh, we want to minimize uh, the function sharp. And uh, we save the result in opts. And uh, let's have a look here at uh, the optimal weights. And obviously also here we have a very concentrated portfolio. So we have uh, zero weight uh, for five stocks. And then uh, we have a concentration in Microsoft 53%. Uh, and then we can also calculate uh, the uh, compound annual growth rate of the optimal portfolio, 36%. And uh, the volatility and also the sharp ratio, so 1.06. And then finally, we can plot and visualize everything together. So here we have uh, the efficient frontier, then we have uh, the risk-free asset, and here's uh, the straight line that actually uh, links uh, the risk-free asset with uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. And indeed, uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio is uh, the tang and C portfolio, when drawing a tangency line from RF to the efficient frontier. So that's uh, the definition of uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. And uh, the straight line here, so the tangency line is also called the capital market line. And I will explain uh, the meaning and uh, the importance of uh, the capital market line in the next lecture. But before and uh, for the sake of completeness, let me just uh, show you the slightly modified uh, formula for unbounded optimization with the linear algebra if uh, we take into account uh, the risk-free asset and uh, the risk-free return RF. So we simply have to deduct here RF from the uh, returns vector here and then we can actually calculate uh, the efficient weights, so the unbounded uh, weights. 
Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In the last lecture, we have found uh, the maximum Sharpe ratio portfolio and uh, the capital market line. And coming now to a more theoretical implication, the two fund uh, theorem. Now, if we include all risky assets uh, that exist and not only the eight stocks, so probably uh, thousands of uh, risky assets, and if all investors have uh, the same homogeneous expectations, these so-called market expectation, then uh, the capital market line is uh, the new efficient frontier because obviously the capital market line dominates uh, the old efficient frontier because it is located more here to the upper left uh, corner, so higher return and lower risk. And uh, all investors should actually hold the maximum sharp ratio portfolio because it uh, wouldn't be optimal to hold any other risky portfolio here. And uh, depending on the individual risk appetite, so every investor should hold a combination of uh, the risk-free asset and uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. And uh, this is why it's called the two-fund uh, theorem because uh, the capital market line can be interpreted as a set of portfolios consisting of two assets. So the risk-free asset and uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. And uh, for example, here we have uh, the portfolio with 100% risk-free asset and 0% uh, max sharp ratio portfolio. And here we have 100% uh, uh, the max sharp ratio portfolio. And here in the middle, we have 50-50. And uh, on this part here, we have more than 100% uh, the maximum Sharpe ratio portfolio financed uh, by borrowing at uh, the risk-free rate. And uh, this is here clearly an assumption that uh, we can borrow at uh, the risk-free rate. And uh, this is maybe not uh, the most uh, realistic assumption, but it is a theoretical model here. And it's uh, one of the most important uh, theoretical models in finance. And as any theoretical model, it actually builds on rather restrictive assumptions that might not fully hold in reality. So for example, the assumption with regard to homogeneous expectations, but uh, the key message is that uh, there should uh, exist a max sharp ratio portfolio with uh, risky assets and uh, the whole market. So all investors should actually hold uh, that portfolio and uh, this is uh, the reason why the max sharp ratio portfolio is also called the market portfolio. Now, many other models and concepts uh, in modern finance build on uh, this uh, theory here. So for example, the black Litterman model, and uh, this is one of the most popular models for advanced portfolio optimization. And uh, we will cover the black Litterman model in the next section. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye.